Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast with your host, Jason Rambo and Sean Alley. We bring you all things sporting clays. Our focus is bringing new shooters to the sport and helping all shooters by giving you the most useful info from coaches, pro shooters, gun clubs, product and service specialists. The Dead Pair Podcast, what every shotgun shooter wants to hear. Paul? Dead Pair! Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rambo, and with me is... The big man, Sean Alley. What's up, buddy? Hey, I'm doing some kind of wonderful here. Yeah, I, I thought we talked about leaving the shop door unlocked. <laughs> Never. Who the hell is this guy sitting there? I don't know. They just come crawling. Oh, it's the world champion David Radulovich. What's going on, Dave? <laughs> Hi, David. You know, I was just driving by and I saw the shop door unlocked. I figured I'd come in and see what was going to happen in this late at night with all the lights on. Yeah. yeah. So what are you what are you doing in this neck of the woods? This is kind of cool. I'm headed uh, back to Arkansas from uh, Rochester. So I was teaching in Rochester for the past week and a half and headed through. And so nice. that's about it. Yeah. That's awesome. The weather's a little chillier up here, I'm sure, than Arkansas. Let me tell you something. So growing up in Cleveland, and obviously you guys know, it's not that big of a deal when it's like 30 degrees. You can wear like a like a T-shirt and a jacket. And right. You're just yeah. used, you're used to it. Right. You're used to it. Well, I only moved down south a year ago. And I sh- I'm showing up to these lessons in Rochester, like between 15 and 30 degrees. And I've got my Sitka hunting, uh, like sweatpants, rain gear, <laughs> three vests, like five <laughs> layers of clothing, hand warmers in my, in my pockets and my shoes. And my students are showing up in like tennis shoes, you know, <laughs> like, he's become a snowbird. I've lost, yeah. <laughs> I've lost it. I just, it's frustrating. Yeah. You gotta get that thick blood up here in the North. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Gosh, thank. So how's the uh, how's the new club coming along? Uh, training facility, excuse me. Yeah, no, it's going really good. Um, I have, uh, I got to get down there. That's what I'm headed down there to do. I got to get some stakes and start staking out a lot of stuff for the dirt work. I've got an excavator and a bulldozer coming in uh, pretty soon. And we'll start doing some work and creating some terrain. And um, it's it's coming along really good. The, the only thing that's kind of delaying us, honestly, is COVID with at the, you wouldn't think this, but the thing that's holding us up is all just the furniture delivery. Oh, really? you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, we've ordered it two months ago and it's still not here. So wow. yeah, I've been hearing a lot of that stuff. We get a lot in our business, just, I mean, the freight, the delivery, the UPS, I mean, it's, it's all a lot longer than it used to be. A year ago it would have been two or three days to get something. Now it's like a week, everything, two yeah. weeks, three weeks. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up the one thing I might actually be able to top you on. You What's may that? be a world champion shooter, but I'm an earth relocation specialist. Okay? Oh, there you go. I will run right up your back with bulldozer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. No, but uh, that's cool though, man. I've, you know, seen your pictures and stuff on Instagram and it, I can't wait to get down there, man. That looks like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. So what it's kind of cool. terrain do you have to deal with down there in Arkansas? I know you probably got to do a lot of build up with the dirt and mounds and stuff, but I mean, what, what kind of natural features do you have to work with in your, in your uh, training facility? It, it was, pr- it was pretty flat. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, as a sporting shooter, my favorite thing about shooting is shooting on cool terrain. Sure. Uh, and when we go over to Europe, you know, some of the world championships that we've shot on, we're shooting on ridiculous terrain, cutouts, quarries, a uh, bunch of stuff like that. And so I wanted, what I wanted to be able to do was, was have a place that we can simulate terrain of any place that we go to. So I want flat, I want little mounds, I want a little bit of rolling stuff, I want straight cliffs, but I also want fields. I want like maybe 10 to 15 foot tall brush. I want uh, wooded areas. Um, and so really we're just kind of building all of that. With the with the dirt that we're moving to, to create the paths and the shooting layouts, I'm gonna kind of relocate and create mounds so I can hide traps behind, put them on top, shoot from on top. Uh, we have a shale pit that we dug out, uh, 55 foot straight cliffs. Um, we wow. can shoot from the top down. Now, let me tell you something: 55 feet, standing right at the edge of that, shooting like a trap teal going out away from you is a really cool shot. Uh, that would get a little yeah. butterfly sitting up there, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So we've got all that, and uh, but we didn't, you know, a year ago. Uh, and, and, you know, as we get some, some of the other stuff down, you probably, you know, by mid March, we're going to have some cool stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. What's, what's it been like to try and balance, you know, building all this and still trying to teach at the same time? It's gotta be a little nerve wracking. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, 
I really haven't cut down the teaching at all. Uh, what I've just cut down is the shooting. Um, kind of a big common misconception uh, in the industry is that pro shooters make a lot of money shooting, which uh, is really where we spend all our money. <laughs> uh, so Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't change no matter how good you are. But um, So I cut back on a lot of the tournaments uh, and was just able to stay home, teach some. You know, for me, I don't, I can't really cut back from my teaching because in a way it actually kind of stresses me out if I'm, if I'm gone from my students for long enough, because if you're anybody, I mean, even a a world championship level shooter, if you go too long without thinking about mechanics or technique or whatever you're doing, bad habits can form. And then when bad habits form, if you're, you know, I always stress with my students that I want you to train. I give them training plans. I'm checking in on them, how, how much they're practicing, what they're doing, trying to target their practice so they know what to do. And uh, so if I go too long without seeing them and there's not somebody there to guide them, you know, it's really easy to create practice scars, you know. Right. So um, I don't want to cut that back. But um, the you know, it's been it's been it hasn't been bad. You know, I honestly I have to say uh, Kaylee has been amazing in the whole thing because um, she's basically self-contracting the whole thing. And I have not had to worry about a single part of it. So. Uh, I've been on the road working while she's been at home running everything. And she's got a lot of experience in that, though, because uh, she flips houses and stuff like that. So she's got all the relationships, does all the all the stuff. And so I'm very lucky. That's good. Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears just for a second, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I've been dying to ask you this question. You know, I don't mean, and, and I want to make sure I make, I'm very clear about this. I do not mean any disrespect to anybody that shot the world feet test this year. Mm -hmm. You know, Anthony, for example, he could never shoot a registered target ever again, and he's still going to be known as one of the greats in the United States. Okay, Mm -hmm. so I don't mean that. As someone that is a past world champion, do you think there will forever be an asterisk next to this year's results because the other countries couldn't join us? Uh, That's a good question. I think that – so – as time goes by and you look at, you know, if you're going to run a Google search to see who the previous world championships, the champions are, um, there, people are going to forget that that was what it was. So in terms of in the future, looking back, I don't think there is going to be an asterisk on it. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to win that shoot, you know, put it that way. And if I did... He, the only reason I wanted to win that shoot is so that I couldn't could not count it, um, because I uh, and no disrespect to Anthony as well, he's a good friend of mine. Um, but if I won that shoot, I, I would not I would not advertise two time World Feet Test champion. It'd be twenty seventeen World Feet Test champion for me, um, just because the name of something is on it. Uh, in my opinion, it, it, you know, that's like saying if you win the the uh, the the world super sporting at Ben Avery every year in in, in uh, Arizona that you're another world champion. And that's not the case right. um, that, you know, the, the that shoot was an unbelievably good shoot. The club did a fantastic job. There were some issues with the the regionals that they had there previously. Um, and so there was some people, you know, worried about, well, maybe they might not be able to handle something like a world championship, totally irrelevant. They put it together flawlessly. Um, the work that the people that were there, uh, put in was as good as a normal world championship, the sponsorship, you know, like Primatic bringing in, I think they brought in almost 300 traps or wow. something like that. Um, that's, you know, cannot go unthanked. The, 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 the vendors and all that kind of stuff. Everybody did what they should do for a world championship, and it was a great shoot. It just should have been called a national championship. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, the reason why, when I, I, I'm a big fan of sportsmanship and ethics and, and legitimacy in sports. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can't compete against the rest of the world, it's not fair for them, you know, not to be there. Yeah. Um, but I, what, what I have to mention, though, was how Anthony handled winning that shoot, which was extremely commendable, respectable. Uh, it, you know, basically, he, after he won it, uh, 
um, you know, he posted on social media that, uh, you know, he's like, I, I knew someone had to win it. So I figured why not be me? Right. And, uh, you know, that's the mindset of a, of a true world champion. And that's what matters. You, you know? know, and to further emphasize my point with Anthony, you know, if you look at his scores, mm -hmm. I, I honestly believe, I, well, here we go. This is all speculation, but yeah. I honestly believe if everybody was there, he still would be the champion because it's obvious he put the work in. Mm -hmm. I mean, he turned a number at the world feet task, and I, I don't think – Personally, I mean, I, I don't know. Who, you know, who knows where everybody else's mindset would have been yeah. that day. You guys know how it is at the top of yeah. the game. We don't. We're trying to figure it out. Yeah. But, um, looking at his numbers and stuff, I, I think anybody else in the world would have had their hands full, let's put it that way. Yeah, typically at a world championship, if you, if you look, uh, anywhere around a 191 is going to win. So I think Anthony shot a 192. Yeah. And so that should be a, a, a good number. Um, the highest score I've seen in, I think, five years is 193. So uh, it should have been the right number. And, you know, I mean, I'm, put, I'm giving all these comments on the World Championship. I have to bring up my own performance. Uh, you know, like, I mean, I, fa I failed at that. I didn't do that bad. I was in, I think I was in the top five. I might've been in the top 50. I don't really remember, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I just didn't get up for the fight on that one. And I think a lot of people didn't, you know, because it's hard to get amped up about a shoot that is like that way. And, and that's why I say for Anthony, that's a, it's, it's not about the world championship title. It's about the performance and the, and the human being behind the, behind the trigger. And Anthony played like a world champion because he showed up competing for a world championship there and not yeah. very many people did yeah, and hopefully people will be fair to him i mean obviously with all the stuff this year with covid and everything it's been a challenge for all kinds of sports i mean football golf you know you name it everybody's yeah. had their hands full so you know hopefully people will give him the respect that he's due oh yeah and hopefully there won't be any people saying well you know well if so-and-so was here or so-and-so was there it yeah. might have been different i mean i really yeah. i, I don't think should have the respect and, yeah. and treat I, it as such i really don't think anybody and I don't know Anthony. I've never met him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I mean, I follow him on Instagram and, and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, the work that that man puts in. Oh, he's one of the greatest of all time. I don't think anybody can deny him his result. Yeah. I mean, I really don't. I mean, he's, he's, the guy's an animal. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, you, you can't at all. Yeah. I mean, that's, I don't think there may be one guy in the sport that you could ever say, well, that guy wasn't there, so did he? Would he really have won? <laughs> yeah. And uh, but you know, it, it Anthony is it was already a world champion. Didn't have to prove anything. Yeah, you know? right. The, the best thing that could have happened for that shoot is that a previous world champion won. Gotcha. So since you're here, and you didn't, by the way, you didn't realize you saw it in the hot seat tonight. <laughs> uh, Look out! I, I like know, controversial. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know you've been an advocate for the World Invitational having shoots with larger payouts at the top, you know, for the best of the best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've been an advocate of that for a long time now. But to back up for a second, um, what do you see as something that can be done from more of a grassroots level to improve the sport? I mean, what can we do as a whole, all of us, to help grow? Um, I think the first the first step that has to be taken is that the the pros themselves need to uh, kind of take a step forward. I think that the best way to uh, push forward a sport is to create heroes. Um, if you if you look at every game that there's is played, there's a reason why at the biggest games in the world, the biggest sports in the world, that these athletes get paid ridiculous amount of money right. right because they're worth it the market demands that amount um and because those people those names those images those people's brands are so valuable because they they pull money if i you know i'm a big golf fan when i was a little kid um i wanted a nike driver because tiger woods played one All right you know right. and and I, and then I got a Nike driver and then the next year he came out with a new one and I wanted that one, you know? Right. And so, uh, look at, look at in all games, that's the way that it is. Um, and shooting should be the same way. Uh, now the reason why I'm a huge fan of the world, that world invitational thing is because as of right now, we as professionals have never played with our own money. 
Right. right. We've never said, here's my own money. I'm betting on myself to win. And if we do, it's like 500 bucks and who really cares? Right. You know? <laughs> right. And so um, what I think needs to happen is that, you know, we need to, cre- we need to create heroes in the game because then you can create, if you, if you, the greatest thing about sporting clays is that as the average Joe, you can sign up for a weekend tournament and shoot with a world champion. Right. And that's really cool. It is. But the, it also is, is, uh, it levels the game so much that it doesn't show the difference between a world champion and an average Joe. Right. You know, I could go to a, a weekend tournament at my home club and shoot a 97 and win by one to a guy that's never left that home club. And right. so there's no, there's if, no differentiation of skill there to show what needs to happen to get to where you're going. And then also to allow contracts to come in to where, you know, you could say, okay, well, we're going to pay this guy this much amount of money so that we can create a platform to market him. Well, I always tell my sponsors, if, if, I, if, if you give me these contracts, I'm signing these contracts and you're paying me this amount of money, why don't you advertise me? I mean, right. when, when, when was the last time that you saw a Parazzi ad in the magazine with my face on it or even with George Digweed's face on it? You don't. Right. right? So if why is it important to create heroes? Because it, not only does it c- create a reason for people to spend money, but it forces someone to say, I want to be like that guy. I want to play. I want to do that sport. You bring the kids into it. You can, you know, like if I, when I go to huge youth shooting tournaments, a lot of times, so the San Antonio rodeo paid me to fly down to, um, to San, to San Antonio, obviously, and, uh, do this event with all these kids. There's thousands of kids at this event. And I'm out there in front of the field teaching these kids and shooting with them and doing it. And, and as they come up, uh, their parents and they themselves are asking me if I'm shooting in that event and where I'm from. They have no idea who I am. They wow. think I'm, I'm, you know, one of the kids that are there competing. Right. So it's like and, a brand recognition problem then. Yeah. And so, you know, like if I could get it to where, uh, you know, like if, why isn't Kim Rohde on a box of Wheaties, you know, yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. something like that. But, you know, why is the sport not talked about? Why, you know, we just need to right. create heroes to bring the message out and use that as a platform to, to grow the sport. Well, let me throw this at you. And, and I asked Mike Hampton this question. I'm not going to tell you his answer because you should be listening to the podcast. And, <laughs> but uh, let me back up. Sometimes things work from a trickle down yeah. effect. So, like what you're talking about, you're talking about players at the top being branded. Mm-hmm. You know, David Radulovich as a brand. Yeah. You know, and and that creates more interest from a grassroots level and gets more guys competing and yeah. joining the NSCA. One of the things that I asked Mike is, you know, you look at Supercross and motocross sponsored by Monster Energy, same way with NASCAR, and they're huge. They're all over TV. You know, Ricky Carmichael, everybody knows who he is. Dell Earnhardt Jr., everybody knows who he is, even though he's retired. But what I'm getting at is if we had a big corporate sponsor, leave the energy drink companies alone. But, you know, I think even Will mentioned it on the podcast with you that you did, um, you know, Budweiser, Coca-Cola, somebody like that. You had a big title sponsor that would allow for larger purses, bigger events. And I hate to say television because there's this sport's really not made for TV and advertising in general, but the advertising in general, right. And the, the notoriety, I think that would help bring in more competitors at a lower level. Do you agree with that? Yeah. The, for people that are listening to this, they're going to hear me talking and say, well, he just wants to be paid more money. (laughs) And so the, (laughs) we uh, all do Dave. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But the reality of it is that, um, if you, it's, it's, it's not about the money. That's why I want to do the world invitational because I want to bet my own money and I want to be put on a platform to where people can watch that because I want people to see that and say, Whoa, that's really cool. You know? And I want to try that game, you know? And it, and so if you, you're not going to put something on TV where you're not showcasing the best in the world. It doesn't happen. There's never, you don't see the, you know, you don't see just the, the weekend league of golf on the golf channel. You see the best players in the world. Right. You don't, you know, pick any sport that you're not going to see at dragway 42 doing races on the speed channel. It's going to be, you know, legitimate professionals racing. Right. right. And, 
and it's growing the sport is about exposure. We can take, we can take the people within the industry like you guys. Okay. So this is a brand, this podcast, right? If you were to market to, this is what doesn't make sense to me. When you drive into the national sporting clays complex, you for the national championship, you see all these banners all over the place to tell you to sign up for the national championship for the next year. I'm already there. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm already there. I'm going to do it again next year. What about the people? That, there's there's 16 or 12 to 16 million people that play this game. And there's the equivalent of 12 to 16 million people that have no idea who George Digweed is. Right. You know, if there's, tell me how many percentage of people that play golf that don't know who Tiger Woods is. Right. right. And people that don't even play golf. Yes. Know who Tiger Woods is. Right. Right. And so I'm not saying shooters should be at the level of professional golfers, but what needs to happen is if like the PSCA was a great experiment because what it did was, is it created something that was cool that people could watch on TV and that makes people, you know, they're flicking through the channels and they get on NBC sports like it was for the first year it's like whoa well i've never seen this game before what is that i'm gonna try it out let me look it up where's the closest club let me go there and try the game and then they buy a gun and then they get hooked right but if you don't have those pros to showcase then that doesn't happen and so it but this is why i say the pros need to take the initiative because we can't keep playing with other people's money there's only so much money for the NSCA to go to Parazzi and say, hey, how about $10,000 again for a sponsorship for the for the national championship? It's like, well, we only make 1,500 guns a year. $10,000 is a lot of money. I, you know, right. what is that going to do? Nothing. Right. But, you know, what if we, if we, if, if I'm willing to say, here's $10,000 of my own money, let's put this into a pot. And then let's film it and let's put it on the internet, not TV, because I can watch the internet anytime, anywhere, and send it to anybody at any time. Exactly. So right. if we did, if we put it on the internet, what have the pros shooting off for their own money, create some drama, and have something that's exciting to watch that it has some level of virility to it online, right. that's the way to do it. You well, know? you just summed it up because that was something Mike said is, you know, you've got millions of people out there that play golf mm -hmm. recreationally. And you know, the PGA tour is not that big. No. Okay. And it's the same thing with us. We've got, like you said, 30 million, 30 million people that bust a clay target every year. Yeah. But then we've got like 15,000 active members of the NSCA. Yeah. You just exactly hit the nail on the head of what that disconnect is. Huge. I, I think that's what it is. Yes. So. It's huge. Sean, you had a good question for David. Let's keep him in the hot seat. Here. Yeah, no problem. So a, a good friend of ours, uh, JD, who shoots with us all the time, he actually brought this up and he said, you know, if you get David in the studio, I got a real down to earth question to ask him. As someone who's achieved the level that you have, mm -hmm. do you still find shooting fun Yeah. At the t at, at doing the tournaments and doing everything that you do right now? And do you still find it as fun as when you first got started? Uh, every person that you ask who's at my level will probably have a different answer than me. Uh, the general consensus, consensus would probably be yes. But for me, um, I don't think I would be, uh, it's not even that I don't think, I know that I would not be as good as I am if I didn't have fun with it. Because I can tell you that, um, like, when I go to a tournament for a world championship, the the reason that I do the game, like my biggest weakness in shooting is that I have too much fun. Okay. <laughs> like I'll go, <laughs> I'll go to a, sh I'm literally, you can ask, um, Asked the people in my squad for the world championship just recently in, uh, uh, at Providence, the one that Anthony, when we were just talking about, that was unarguably the easiest world feed task to win ever mm -hmm. right so uh, obviously I, I wanted to win that so i go and on on the first day on my second layout there's this target it's a it was started out at 80 yards came in full belly to about 30 yards stalled out and fall down hit the ground. i'm shooting on a squad with uh there's kaylee and then um there was like four other shooters, probably averaging between E and C class. Okay. Not a single person missed this target. I never hit it because I thought it'd be fun to shoot <laughs> it at, at 75 yards coming up, you know, in the middle of a world championship. Oh and so, gosh. you know, that's my, it, I love the game so much that when I shoot really good, it's because I'm, I'm enjoying it. And, uh, and I don't feel pressure because it's a game. And, you know, one of my favorite things 
that I ever uh, got to do in the game was when, when we first started doing the Behind the Break podcast and I was talking to Justin. I was over in England and I was like, hey, I want to interview these the three greats over here that we never get to hear from. So the first interview I did was Richard Falls, which was awesome. Second interview I get to do is George Digweed. And and I'm at the point where this is the year after I just won the world championship. And I'm like, okay, I, you know, I'm getting the chance to sit down with the greatest shotgunner, in, I mean, 26 time world champion. And I had all these questions that I wanted to learn that I wanted to know. So I'm like, I'm going to use this opportunity to ask this guy. And so I'm asking all these questions about how you deal with pressure. How do you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to defend my own world title. How do you've done it 25 times? What, you know, <laughs> how do you do that? And, um, and he looked at me, he's like, he goes, it, you have to understand this is a game. You know, this is a game. This We're isn't life targets. and death. Yeah. This is, you know, this is a game. Why are you here? You're doing it for fun. If you win, that's, that's a bonus. That's a, that's you know? a, that's a fantastic yeah. answer. Well, and, and, and a part of that, uh, another part of that question is, so as someone who goes out to a tournament, and I know you do very well, you shot 99s, 100s, 98s, all that stuff. Once you reach that level, what keeps you going? What's the driving force to keep you moving forward? Yeah, so? and before you answer that, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory on that question. So Sean and I were actually sitting here talking earlier, and it was like, you know, I remember when we started off, man, if I could just consistently get in the 60s. Then it was the 70s. Yep. Yeah. Then now it's the 80s. And then it's the 90s. And, you know, it's like we looked at each other and it's like, you know, this kind of feeds into that question that, that our buddy asked. Well, well, David shoots at the pinnacle. So what, what's he trying to consistently do? Yeah, what keeps you know? I mean, pushing you? I mean, that's, yeah. we're, we're chasing something right now. And when you're chasing something, it's easy to go after it, I think. But yeah. at some point when you get to it and you say, okay, I'm shooting a 98, I'm shooting a 99, I'm shooting an occasional 100. What's left? What what yeah. keeps you what keeps you driving on? Yeah. Um, so I, it's funny that you asked that question because I just yesterday in a lesson was having a having a discussion with a guy uh, who the, a, a student of mine for the past uh, couple months that he, the first time uh, that he took a lesson from me was was fairly recently. But every time I go up to Rochester, he's taking a lesson from me. He had an eye dominance problem his whole life. He's shot and he's a great shot and he. And he's uh, uh, what we call um, uh, R one L two. Okay, so um, which is it's a it's not too complex of an eye dominancy issue. But long story short, I was able to fix it. And and this whole life life he's shot with a patch or winked an eye, and and I taught him how to shoot with both eyes open, totally normal, and kind of changed the game. And we got to this one target uh, that he struggled with in a tournament, and he goes. Um, you know, and I told him, I said, you're going to have to learn who you are and you're going to have to learn which I won't say his name. So I'm just going to say, John, which John shows up today during a round. And you're going to have to evaluate, OK, these this is my skill set today and this is the parameters that I'm working with. And I'm so much percent away from perfect. And right now I can't do what I want to do. So I'm going to have to do this other option. I know this sounds very vague, but basically what I'm saying is perfect option for him is to shoot two eyes, uh, open, pull the trigger when the mount finishes, uh, at touching his face. And, and, but some days when things aren't perfect, meaning confidence, trust, sleep, eyes, hydration, nutrition, exercise, energy level, strain, all that kind of stuff. When that's not perfect, can't do that because something happens neurologically, psychologically, physiologically that doesn't allow him to make the shot with both eyes open because of his eye dominancy problem. So he has to do something else. And he goes, well, I want to get to the point in the game where I can just always do the same thing. And I said, John, let me explain something to you. Um, I'm I, like right now for me, I'm at the top of the game. I'm at the best I've ever been doing myself. And I don't always have And if I win or lose a match, it's not because I, I didn't have the capability to win. Every shoot that I go to, I have the ability to mechanically win. There hasn't been a target in 10 years that I've seen that I couldn't hit. And the reason why I miss is because I make a strategy choice that's wrong. 
So I, I run the analysis of probability of saying, okay, well, if I do this, it'll end that way. If I do that, it'll end that way. Um, and I'm trying to gauge that off of like what I was saying, how much sleep I got, how much nutrition I, I'm where, you know, all these different things. And, um, and I either say, all right, I narrow it down to two choices. I pick this choice and I go execute it and I might miss one or I might run it or I might miss three. Um, the reason why this game is so much fun is because it doesn't matter what level you're at you or what score you shoot. You never shoot a perfect round. I've never shot a perfect round before. And what's so much fun to chase is that, you know, I could at the, this, this summer, I shot the Northeast, the North Central Regional, Ohio State shoot, and then the South Central Regional. The Northeast Regional, all of my students on my squad beat me. At the Ohio State shoot, my sister beat me. <laughs> and then, and then I'm, and then I get fed, I'm, I'm shooting terrible, and then I get fed up and I go and I shoot the South Central Regional in Houston, and I decided that I was going to win that shoot before I showed up. I put the effort in to try to practice to get ready. On the first day of the prelim, I shot, I think, a 96 because I made four choices that were bad, thinking that I had what I needed to make the moves that I decided I could make in the strategy choice that I had. And I and I missed four. The next day in the main event, I shot a 91 and t um, I, I made two strategy choices that were bad, thinking that, you know, I was basically, I call it like a, um, a, a seven or a five, meaning that um, if I make the specific uh, choice, I'm going the safe choice. I'll hit a seven out of eight. If I make the risky choice, it requires more of a holistic David that day as a competitor. I'm either going to get a five or I'm going to get an eight because it's either going to go bad or it's going to go perfect. So on Friday, I was doing a lot of the the eight or five or five choices and they were always ending up as fives on saturday i did the same thing they mostly end up in fives on sunday i said i don't have what it takes this weekend obviously i've failed the last two days i'm going to do all seven choices and and then i ended up winning so for what's fun for me to do when i'm shooting is is that it's always a game it becomes a game of strategy at the top of the game it's and so it's like you know I could have shot the whole weekend and, and uh, I could have had the best mechanical game there that whole week, but I could have came in fifth place because I made bad de decisions. Right. And that's what it becomes, you know. All right. <clears throat> Another one for you. Now, if we can back up, and I know it's been a while since you were a new shooter. I remember when me and Jason got started, uh, we'd, we'd shot before. We'd go out in our fields and had our own throwers and stuff. And so we'd, we'd shot clays before. Chromatics, I hope. Uh, well, no. sure. <laughs> I, think, I think they were the little orange or red plastic thingies, the hands oh, yeah. things that you just whip no, them out No, it wasn't there. that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so if you can think back that far or in that mindset, it's real easy when you're getting into the sport to blame your problems mm. on other things. Yeah. I don't have an expensive enough gun. I'm not using the right shells. I'm not using these fancy new chokes. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, did we go down these bad roads? <laughs> well, but I think every new shooter wants to, that's the easy thing to look at. Well, I'm yeah. not shooting a Parazzi. I'm not shooting a Kriegoff. I'm not shooting, you know, whatever. Uh, or I'm not, I'm not buying, you know, the high dollar shells, you know, that's why I'm missing. I, mm -hmm. you know, so what kind of advice would you give to a new shooter that's kind of in that mindset? It's like, well, my gun's not good enough. I'm not shooting good enough shells, whatever it is, whatever they're blaming it on. Yeah. Where do they, we need to focus first. Where would you put your, all the time you got to focus on you. Um, I mean, have you ever been to a, a, a concert and saw a guy pull out a famous guitar player, pull out a guitar that's got holes in it? Sure. <laughs> we know exactly who you're talking yes. about. Yes. <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is, look at my gun. I mean, it's in my car right now and I've got tape all over the stock and, you know, um, it's not, is it about the equipment at the top end of the game? Yes. If you have the financial ability to buy the equipment that you want to finish the game with at the start, that's a huge advantage because you never have to switch. Um, but I always as a coach and as a competitor, I'm always trying to find the lowest hanging fruit and the biggest percent increase in my overall performance and proficiency in the game. So in the beginning of, of your learning progress, you can either decide to spend $1,000 on 
uh, or let's say ten thousand dollars on a new gun. Okay. If you stayed with your eighteen hundred dollar gun and spent ten thousand dollars on shooting lessons, I realize that that statement's coming from a shooting coach. <laughs> <laughs> but it still, you can get so much further ahead in the game because um, it's yes the. If I were to tell you that the equipment doesn't matter, I would be lying. But at the beginning of the game, does it? And my sponsors are going to hate me for saying this, but at the beginning of the game, if you're just starting and you're at fifty to sixty-five percent, does getting that really expensive gun get you ten percent, or does taking one lesson for a hundred and fifty dollars an hour? gets you 10%. Guarantee you that in two hours you can get 10% if you're starting out at 50 from a really good instructor. And so, but now when it gets to the point where you're shooting 85 and 90 and 95%, now a new gun might get you 3%. And 3% in this game is six birds in a big tournament. That's yeah. a huge increase. But it's gonna be a it's gonna be hard for me to take lessons at that end of the game to get me six birds in a big match. Right, because how many people are going to be ahead of where you're at if you're already shooting in the 90s? Yes. You know, who, yes. Who, how many people can help you? Yes, literally? yeah. If you're shooting 95s and you come to me for a lesson I, I and I find something, um, you know, yeah, I might be able to get you, you know, it might even be in a strategy choice or it might be in your preparation or your research phase of your, of your program and we can get you a couple birds, but... You know, if you're shooting, uh, you know, a gun that doesn't fit, that doesn't move good, that doesn't point, that doesn't bounce, or if you're shooting ammo, you know, a ammo is a big thing. When I was decide, I went for seven years and bought my own ammo because I was waiting for a, a, a really specific. I was waiting for Game Boy to be imported in the United States. So when I was making the decision on what to buy. I did a lot of testing, and there's certain ammo that is a big brand. I'm not going to say it, but it's a, a big name company. Where when I was shooting birds at like 75, 80 yards, I literally could not hit it. I would put that ammo in, shoot it, miss. Put another one in, shoot it, dead center. Put that ammo in, shoot it, miss. Put another ammo in, dead center. Wow. And so, yeah, absolutely, ammo will make a big difference. You want something that's consistent. That's you know, guns going to make a diff big difference. Glasses, huge difference. Um, you know, so but but that that percent increases at the end of the game, not at the beginning. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would definitely agree with that. I mean. Sean and I, we spent money in, oh my gosh, every wrong avenue you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really did. Oh, yeah. And we, it was we chased it was, all kinds of problems yeah, that really course. weren't there. Yeah. The problem was us. It wasn't yes. the uh, arrow. It was the Indian. Yes. It was, so. it was a total experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really was. Um, but, um, again, when you get caught up on the podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, right after Christmas, I took some in-laws out that have never shot a gun in their life. Took them to Cardinal. Rented guns. And they're hooked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right now, right now, they could care less about Kohler, Kriegoff, Parazzi, mm -hmm. Zoli. You know, give me a gun that shoots shells. I want to go break more targets. Yeah. Right. Once they get their feet wet with that, then we move on to lessons and shells and yeah. guns and all that kind of thing. But to your credit of what you said, you can ask Sean. Last year after the Northeast Regional, I had had enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt like I was shooting blanks at the end of my gun. Yeah. I mean, I could not figure out what was going on. That's when Bill and I got together, Bill Elliott. Yes. And he elevated my game quickly. Of course, Sean and JD had to follow my coattails. Oh, look at him shooting good. We're going to go take lessons with Bill. So <laughs> now their games have elevated as well. But that is definitely, once a person steps into competition phase, that is definitely definitely the quickest shortcut the I most i feel it's the most dollar for dollar the most well money spent is yeah. the coach and, and if we would have known that yeah at the beginning and believed that had somebody actually come to us and said look no really the gun's fine you know what you're shooting is fine the shells you're shooting are fine it's just you need some help on your technique, your planning, your you know how to read targets so on yeah. and so forth that's going to come into a much bigger 
uh, benefit to you to learn that than it is to buy that ten or fifteen thousand oh. dollar gun. But you know, yeah. again, we went the wrong way, and that's why we're doing this podcast. I mean, yeah. that that is the bottom line why right. we're doing this podcast. We're trying to help the the early on shooter, the the new shooter that's trying to figure out how do I get better, how do I compete, how do I start winning my class, so on and so forth. And that's exactly why we're doing this. You know, without even with without even changing your mechanics or your technique or anything about how you move the gun. If I just taught you how to make a plan, I could get you at least one bird a station if you're starting out. That's 16 targets. Yeah, that's huge. You know, that's huge. <laughs> I mean, because how many people, you, I, can't, I, I have over a thousand students. Every single one that's come to me, you know, they're like, well, uh, you know, after the first pair and I realize what I'm doing, I say, wait, wait, stop. Just listen to the sentence that you just said. You use the first pair as an experiment. Yep. You know, yeah. <laughs> why would you do that? Right. You're, you're taking a minimum of, uh, you know, at the worst or at the best, if you're using it as an experiment, you're probably going to get away with 50% on that first pair. Well, that, yeah, that goes back to what Bill always tells me, you know, like a pilot, they have a check down list they go through before they ever yeah. think about taking that plane in on, on the taxiway or runway, whatever. He didn't do his check down list on the first pair. Oh, yeah. So he dutched the first pair. Okay, now I'm going to try this. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. And that's that's where I think a coach makes that shortcut. Yeah, oh, we, yeah. All, we all did it. Mm-hmm. It's just we didn't yeah. realize what we were doing at the time until yeah. <laughs> much later. Right. <laughs> so, so school, something, school of hard knocks. <laughs> yeah. So something cool is coming up. Sean's going to Gator Cup. Yes. And we just so happened to have someone that just texted me. And I think Dave might know who this guy is. I'm sure he does. That is waiting on us to call. We're going to talk about you going down to the Gator Cup. You want to call him? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Editor's note, we want to apologize to our listeners. We had to catch up with Ryan earlier in the evening as we were waiting for David Radulovich to arrive. He had been driving uh, all day from New York City, and uh, he arrived a little bit later than we expected. However, we are going to go ahead and insert Ryan Harper and listen to his take on uh, the shooting in Florida. And hopefully you'll enjoy the track as much as we did. And then we're going to catch up with Joe Fanese and David Rodulovich in studio. All right. We are joined with Ryan Harper. Ryan, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good. How about y'all? Uh, we're doing good. What part of the world do you hail from? Oh, I'm, I'm from Mulberry, Florida, just down here in the south. Gotcha. How's the weather? Oh, right now I'm sitting on the back porch and it's about 60 degrees. It's, it feels nice. Yeah, I'm jealous. I think it's about 25 here, so you got, <laughs> hey, you got us beat. <laughs> hey, Ryan, this is Jason Rambo. How you doing tonight, bud? I'm doing pretty good. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Ryan, for those that don't know who you are, can you can you give us a little bit of your background? Can you talk about how you got started in shooting? Uh, yes, sir. So, um, well, I'm 22 years old for starters. Uh, I've been hunting and fishing my whole life. Really never got into shooting sporting clays or anything like that until um, December of 2015. Um, before then, I always shot like one one fundraiser every year that we put on. But, uh, but yeah, so I got in with a group of guys down at one of these ranches down here in central Florida and they have a little five stand and we just kind of got together and I started getting better and better at it. And I got with the right coach and I mean, things just kind of took off from there. Started off right. Uh, what coach were you working with, Ryan? Um, I worked with Mike Longo, which I highly recommend him. He's, that's the only coach I've ever had. And, um, I took lessons from him for about, about a year. Um, but he taught me, I mean, I just work really good with him. A lot of people do. Uh, he's just, he's a really good coach, hands down. Yeah, we were able to catch up with Mike um, during the Florida State shoot down there. He set the targets. Well, him and uh, Doug Vine did. Yeah, sir. Uh, man, what a nice guy. Super cool guy. Oh, yeah, he's awesome. He's he's extremely nice, and he's he's great with kids, too, and lessons and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I've become really good, really good buddies with him over the past couple of years. So I'm going to ask you the same question that uh, I'm going to ask Joe Finese here in a little bit. Um, he's going to be on the show tonight, too, with you. Uh, awesome. What does training 
or practice consist of for Ryan Harper? Like when you go out to work on something, what do you, do you, you know, we all work on something with a purpose or a plan. What is the, what does a training regimen look like for Ryan Harper? <laughs> well, it's funny. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all the, a lot of the main, you know, top shooters, they practice, you know, a whole lot and all that stuff on and off. They give lessons and, um, get to look at targets all the time and that kind of stuff. But honestly, this past year, 2020, I shot probably a combined of <laughs> about 200 practice shots. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, that's, that was January or February, really. Um, I kind of went out with a couple of buddies and just kind of shot around. Uh, I was about to get ready for the season and then all of COVID hit. Um, so, I mean, from then on, I just kind of, I was working and then I'd hit a bunch of the major tournaments, you know, that were around kind of the Southeast in the beginning of the year. And then, um, but yeah, I mean, I, when I firstly started out, I shot that five stand, like I was talking about earlier with a bunch of my buddies. Um, and honestly, I didn't really like focus on one exact target. I was just kind of shooting and practicing and then. When I actually got with Mike, when he'd give me a lesson, we'd find one bird. Um, we'd go through the really easy course. We'd go through the really hard course. And I'd, we'd always find one bird, no matter if it could be, you know, a little 10-yard, no spring, little pop-up bl- blooper. And <laughs> I'd have the worst time with that. Just, I mean, that's just kind of how I am. Those easy ones always get me. Right. Um, which, you know, it gets a lot of people. But honestly, I just... I don't practice and I made a pact with myself this year, almost my new year's resolution type of thing that, uh, I try to plan on shooting more than 200 practice <laughs> around this year. Yeah, it's, not, it's not like you were going out trying to save ammo, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I wouldn't no, I wasn't trying to save ammo. I just kind of, you know, hunting season kind of got me when Turkey season came around and then I got all these big shoots. And once I got back from the big shoots, I had a little bit of work and also I'm doing school on top of that. Um, so I just never really got the chance to really practice. I mean, when I go to a major tournament, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't get a practice card. I'd shoot a couple rounds of make or break, um, here and there kind of as a warm up. but you know, I just kind of load the gun and go for it pretty much the whole year this year. Sounds like a bunch of natural talent to me. What do you think, Sean? Yeah. Yeah. Lucky <laughs> guy there. Yeah, really. So I appreciate that, but I, luck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sometimes a little bit of luck can go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned school. Uh, what are you going to school for? Where are you going to school at? Um, well, I'm in Gainesville uh, at Santa Fe right now. I'm waiting on to see if I get into Florida. I just I, I used to go to straight out of high school. I went to Lindenwood University um, for a year and a half. And uh, that was fun. I mean, it was a good experience and all that kind of stuff. I'm just not really – I'm not made for the north. I'm more of a southern guy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I um, I moved back home, and um, I didn't get so lucky with a lot of my credits transferring, so I couldn't really get into any bigger schools. Um, I had the grades, but I just – not a lot of my credits transferred, so I had a hard time, but I'm kind of working towards that right now. Um but I'm I'm studying uh, ag finance. Oh, nice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so I got a question for you. Are you planning on going to the Gator Cup this year? I sure am. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to be heading it. down myself, so hopefully we can run into each other. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's one of my – that's probably my favorite term of the year, honestly. I haven't missed it since I started, so I just love shooting at that place. They used to be my home club what i classify it as you oh, can't nice. you can't miss sean ryan trust me you'll be easy to find <laughs> <laughs> yeah just I'll, uh, I'll be looking for him a, a big sasquatch bearded guy about six four three seventy five <laughs> you won't miss me so i'll uh all right well i'll, I'll be stick a short... out like, i'll stick out like a sore thumb i trust trust me all right i'll be the short sasquatch guy with a mullet and a beard <laughs> all right <laughs> well, we'll have to hook up then <laughs> so maybe we'll find each other uh good good you, you were telling me the other day ryan you're fortunate enough to pick up a sponsor you want to tell everybody who that is uh yeah so it's krieg off um so i'm really blessed to have them they came up to me at worlds in 2019 the world english 
in Chicago. Um, and I kind of talked to Alex, you know, the main guy at Creek off and, um, we hit it off a little bit and I was shooting good at worlds at the time, uh, tied for second junior. Um, and I mean, it was just kind of a, a good get together with us and things went as planned for me. And I'm really blessed to have him as one of my sponsors. I've, I've, um, ever since I really got into sporting clays, I've shot in a Creek off. I shot an old Beretta 686 and then I went to a blazer that I got from one of my buddies here, at the five stand. And then when I really got into sporting clays, I got a K80 Creek off K80 sporter and I fell in love with it and I've shot it the past four years. Yeah. Four years. Nice. So, and I'm loving them. Yeah. Great gun. Great. Yes, sir. It is. All right. Well, we ask everybody this question. Um, think back, uh, it might be a little while ago or maybe recently. I don't know. What is one of your, or what is your favorite memory shooting sporting clays? Or I guess you can maybe do one more than one, but, uh, if you can kind of think back, either an event or something that happened uh, to you, or even with the squad you were with, what, Does, what yeah, was, it doesn't necessarily need to be a win. Just, yeah. just your favorite yeah, round. Yeah. Or... Well, uh, well, heck, you kind of caught me off guard on that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we all, I mean, we all have a lot of good memories with the sport. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. But if there's anything in particular that, that sticks out, it doesn't yeah, matter it's... how obscure, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, heck, I've been shooting for five years, going on my six, I guess, and there's, <laughs> you know, there's so many good memories on in this shooting sport. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to say, really, my first year shooting, I was involved with Young Guns at Quail Creek, and we went out to Ohio, and um, me and Nick Blinker, which is another good friend of mine, and Clayton Cutshaw, um, we ended up winning nationals, but I'd say that whole trip, you know, from, I mean, really just that whole week, you know, playing basketball with all the people, all the kids that were in SCTP and, um, I mean, it was just, everybody got together and that was probably one of the more fun parts that or <laughs> Florida state every year, just getting with a good group of people. Right. Um, one night, like a Friday night or Saturday night and everybody's having a good time and cracking jokes around. Normally it's cold cracking jokes or all around the fire and that kind of stuff. I mean, just simple things like that. I'd say, um, caught me off guard. I'm trying to think of one single moment. (laughs) That's all right. We're not trying to put you on the spot. Yeah. There's no right or wrong answer. I kind of get what you're saying though, Ryan. It's funny you say that because one of my favorite shoots every year is the Ohio state shoot. And it's not Mm -hmm. so much, I mean, don't get me wrong. The competition is what we live for. Right. But, Oh yeah. It's, you know, like not this past year because of COVID, but 2019 is a good example. So Sean and I and our wives and then, you know, all of our friends that we shoot with and their wives, you know, we would all sit around. We had, the, you know, of course, big formal dinner. Um, we got to watch the shoot offs, the award ceremony. You know, they call your name. You get up and get a plaque if you were fortunate enough to shoot well enough. And just the whole experience, that's that's definitely one of my favorites every year. So I get what you're saying. It's hard to pick one because it seems like there's so many involved with the sport, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I know that. I mean, I got. I mean, there's just because it's real recent. Um, I got one memory that I mean I'll probably cherish for forever. Honestly, um, we were at Providence Hill in Mississippi shooting at the uh, what they called the World Fee Task. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm good friends with Joe Finesi and also um, Jonathan Goodrich, and they were both over there talking and. Because they both shot 99s on the uh, Providence Cup. Uh-huh. And I was sitting over there, and it was probably Friday or – yeah, it was Friday afternoon. We we're all just kind of joking around. They started talking about the 99, and, and I was just thinking in my house, like, well, Dad Gum, I got to shoot this tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. <laughs> 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 and uh, I was fortunate enough, I missed on, like, my third station and shot a 99, and I came back. and <laughs> I mean, we're all were just so stoked because we all three tied, but I – you know, I just kind of, that was just a funny moment with them talking about and everything. It just kind of got in my head. I was like, Dad Gump, here we go. We got, <laughs> yeah, we no pressure. Try something here. <laughs> yeah. Thought it was but, over and we're just getting started. 
I'm so sorry, do what? No, I said you thought it was over and you were just getting started. <laughs> oh yeah, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan, do, did you or have you or do you have any set goals for this year for shooting? As far as like accomplishments? Um well my first goal as of right now is to practice more this year, but my accomplishments, um I mean I'd say I'd like to work on my mental game a little more. Uh, that's, that's really my biggest account or goal for this year. Um, cause I can shoot a really good score first or second day, whichever one it is. And the other score will be down a little bit. It'll still be up there, but it'll be down a little bit. Um, and it's just all really just my mental game. Um, so really just working on that is my biggest goal for this year. Cause I mean, I've come in top 10 and, um, good amount of bigger tournaments this past year and, just not quite there and i came close at the uh southeast regional a couple weeks ago um with a little bit of a comeback there but um really i'm just trying to focus on my mental game because i know if i get that then i'll be a little little better up there i'll be a little more up there in each tournament yeah it's funny you say that because you know we have these conversations all the time and and we we try to our podcast is you know trying to get out there to new shooters and and I think a lot of new shooters, they, they get the wrong idea about what is going to make them a better shooter. A lot of them think it's the gun, the shells, maybe the shooting jacket that they're wearing or whatever. But, you know, in our experience, even though we've only been shooting a short while, I mean, the mental part of it is such a huge, huge part of the sport. And it's not, you know, you can have all the ability in the world, but if you can't keep it mentally in check and keep your focus and, you know, not drift off or not lose sight of, uh, you know, after you just ran three easy pairs, you're on your fourth pair. I got this, you know, in a blink of an eye, you can drop a bird or two. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize just how critical the mental game, the mental part of this game is. Oh yeah. It's, it's extremely critical. I mean, I mean, you can put it this way at the regional this year, um, on Saturday, the Southeast regional at South Florida, um, on Saturday, I got up there and I dropped one on my first station. I got to the next station. I ran that station and I wasn't really thinking about anything. I was just thinking we got to, you know, just kind of keep it rolling. And, um, very next station, I dropped three and then the very next station I dropped two wow. and then the oh, next wow. station I dropped four. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> We've all been there. All, all came away from me at once. And I mean, you know, that's, that's nine birds right there. I mean, that's, 10 birds in my first couple of stands. And, um, I mean, I only missed three, the rest of the course after those, but, um, I mean, it was just, you know, I got to get that mental game in there constantly throughout my round and not kick it all in together after I'm already down a good bit. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to focus after harder. a bad run like that, because that's weighing in the back of your mind, every station you come up to every bird seems to be more important than the one you just shot. I mean, it's just, it's really hard to keep that calm, cool, collect demeanor when you're out there shooting when you know that oh man i've dropped these birds and if i drop any more i'm going to be in real trouble and you know it, it can get to be a real real bad head game uh if you let it get to you oh yeah i, I 100 percent agree with that <laughs> <laughs> so let's have some fun here we we always do this with the shooters um it's called rapid fire questions okay uh, all right um i'm gonna go through a list here you ready I'm ready. We're going to try. All right. Gun. Tree golf. 32 or 34 inch? 32 inch. Chokes? I shoot extreme chokes. Constrictions? Or do you do you stick with one or do you change? Uh, I stick with one. I shoot 20s on both barrels, which is modified. All right. Shells? Uh, Winchester AA light handicaps. What do you you shoot that? What do you shoot for fee task? Same thing. Same thing. Glasses. Yes, sir. Pilas. Vest or shell bag. Vest. Brand. Castellani. Ear protection. Uh, grannies at. Um, <laughs> I, I call her. Everybody calls her granny. I know who you're um, talking about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, everybody calls it granny. I just got little custom ear molds in. Not they're not the electric ones, they're just the old old fashioned cheap ones. Yep. Now she does a good job. 
That was pretty. She does. That was pretty good, Ryan. That was that was impressive. I've, I've asked some people these questions. I got to two of them, and thirty minutes later, we got to the rest of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I was ready. I told you, I was ready for him. Now <laughs> he was. So, you got any closing thoughts? Anything you want to add, bud? Um, really, the only thing I'd say is for all the people listening out there, especially you know the younger shooters or newer shooters of the game, if you find the right coach you know to start out with like i did it kind of shows you if you start with the right one and stick with them it can give you a good bit of success it may take some time but it'll give you some good success and i think that's the best way to start the sport is really finding the right coach right you're, off the bat you're definitely a, a perfect example of that to have the success you have and at such a young age and so fast so you're you're definitely a good example of that yeah that's great advice well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, unfortunately, I will not be joining Sean down at the Gator Cup. Um, I got to stay back here and deal with snow up to my butt and uh, cold weather. <laughs> but, oh, um, man, the wimp. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but make sure and find the big guy down there. Um, it'd be great to catch up with you. I'm sure he's, he's, he's sitting here nodding his head at me. I'm sure he's looking forward to it. So, and, oh, good, yeah. luck, and good luck to you. Oh, I appreciate it. I look forward to meeting him, too. Just remember, just look for the guy with the mullet and the beard. That's all I got to say. <laughs> mullet and the beard. I'm sure Mom you'll be the, the only one, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Well, Ryan, we we very much appreciate your time, bud. Um, have a good evening. Like I said, good luck down at the Gator Cup, and uh, hopefully I'll get to catch up with you here to shoot soon. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys, and I really appreciate what you all have done here. And- Hopefully we can catch up pretty soon. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Look forward to meeting you. Thanks, Ryan. Yes, sir. All right. Take care. Bye. See you. Hello. Hey, Joe. How you doing? It's Jason Rambo from the Dead Pair Podcast. Hey, Mr. Jason. I'm doing great. Thanks. How about yourself? (laughs) Doing good. (laughs) Hey, Joe. This is Sean Alley. We've got a special guest here. I'd like to say hi to you. What's up, Joe? It's David. Hey, what's up, David? How you doing, man? <laughs> Pretty good. Hey, congratulations on on A and M. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm uh, really excited about that. I've had my uh, sights on A and M for a couple of years now. I've really wanted to go there, and just glad it all kind of came together. I'm looking forward to it. That's all. What? Hey, what's your uh, what's your major going to be, Joe? I'm going to go into construction science, and my minor is going to be landscape architecture. Oh wow! Cool. Sweet. Very cool. Yes, sir. Sweet. Well, we called you up because it just so happens that Sean here is heading down to your neck of the woods. He's coming down for the Gator Cup. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I just like to kind of get awesome. out of this cold, terrible right weather. Corner, man. Coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, before we get into that, man, looks like you've been traveling a little bit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I have. You know, I've been very blessed to be able to go to a lot of tournaments and you know, the later part of 2020, uh, traveling the NSCA tour, which has been a lot of fun, you know, going to all the regionals and nationals and the world feed test. So that was great. And, uh, it's just a cool experience to be able to share, you know, uh, my family being able to travel with them and make a lot of memories along the way. And, uh, you know, as far as traveling to the tournaments is great at the same time, you know, you're there to, to do business and shoot. So it's hard to kind of be a tourist and enjoy where you are because you're, you know, focused on shooting. But I mean, when I'm outside of shooting, I do love to travel and, you know, go different places and try to soak up any chance I can. Kind of did a little staycation, I guess you can say. I stayed in Florida here a couple weeks ago. I went down to Miami to watch the, the Orange Bowl, the Capital One Orange Bowl. I love watching college football. It's my oh, nice. favorite sport to watch. So I went there with a couple friends and we hung out in Miami, kind of, you know, went to Miami Beach and did all that. And that's where the rest of my family actually lives, is down in South Florida. So we were able to do that. And, you know, yeah, that's it's been, you know, pretty much it. We uh, go to Montana a couple times a year because my family, we have a home out there in uh, northwest Montana. So we go in the summers and then we went uh, for Thanksgiving early in the year. So that was a lot of fun. And I got to go up there and see the snow. That's something I don't get to see a whole lot. I know you guys up north are used to yeah, it. But we're sick of it, Joe. Yeah, yeah, you can have all yeah. the yeah. snow we got. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll stamp it till you put it in a box and send it pretty your cool, way. Pretty cool for a, for a Floridian kid to see the snow. So that's always fun. And, 
And then I'm headed out to Texas on Friday to go check out A and M and get a housing uh, apartment for me to see where I'm gonna oh, live. Cool. So yeah, it's been it's been fun. Joe, if you, nice. if you like the snow, then what you got to do is in at the end of the year, you've got to come up to the Cardinal Center for the Pilgrim shoot. That's oh, under the yeah. lights. Oh, the night shoot. That. Yeah. yeah. Most of the time. When is that? It's in, what is it, November? Yeah. I think. He, I think uh, it's the day that daylight savings time happens. Yeah. Jake said it should be for 2021. should be the second weekend in November, I think. Yeah. It's right, it's, af- right after Halloween. Okay. If yeah. you get lucky, like two years ago, that was an absolute blizzard. And so you're shooting under the lights <laughs> with the snow, which makes the snow like it's so much fun to it shoot. It was surreal. Yeah. It's you know, a, you'd have a great that's time. That's a bucket list thing for you me. You gotta do for it for sure. I I've never shot in the snow. Oh um, man, I, I would love to do that. I, I've never shot in the snow. Something I've always wanted to. Oh, picking out a, a little it's orange bird and amongst all those little white snowflakes is, is <laughs> you can it's, see a it's little, a new experience. Yeah, that little vapor like trail. A lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. While you're while you're up, you gotta check out uh Dan Bailey's place, Eagle's Nest. That place is just gorgeous. He does a great job. Oh yeah, I've, I've actually been to um I've been to Eagle's Nest a couple of times. I really oh, like okay. uh Mr. Dan. He's he's got a great uh, setup and he's got a great crew there working. Miss Loud and Slaughter does a great job there. Yes. You know, helping with a lot of stuff and they uh they have a Ohio is a beautiful state, great state. I love it. I love shooting there. You know, I used to shoot a lot of SCTP, and uh, so we would go up there for about a week to shoot SCTP nationals when it was in at the Cardinal Center in Marengo. So I shot at a handful of clubs around there, like Eagles Nest and uh, Black Wing, and uh, you know some of those clubs up in Ohio. So mm-hmm. it's a great state. I love it. Yeah, we're pretty spoiled. We've got some phenomenal clubs here in Ohio. Um, so have you been doing any training in, in the off season? And, and if so, what is, what does training consist of for Joe Finese? I think that you have to have your mind made up on what exactly uh, you want to accomplish. And every time you go out to shoot, you have to shoot with purpose. You know what I mean? You shouldn't right. just don't go out there just for oh, repetitions. I'm just going to put some shells through the gun. I know it sounds really cliche, but it's good to go out and, you know, have something that you want to work on and kind of set a goal before you even get the, the gun loaded at the first position you're going to shoot from in practice or a training session or, or whatever you want to call it. And um, I just, at least for me, I like to go out every day and, and when I do practice, just uh, set a goal, say, okay, I'm going to work on something today and then just really focus in and dial on that, whether it be, um, you know, shooting a, a certain target presentation or trying to be really consistent. It's just being able to repetitively execute something because with sporting clays, especially, you know, with sporting clays practice, it's it's good to kind of simulate the tournament and prepare the, for the tournament because that's the whole point of practicing. You know what I mean? Like when a lot of the competitors, you know, we go out to train, we're not, you know, there to, you know, just have a good time or cut up. You know, a lot of times we're out there to be serious when it comes to practice. We're not doing it for recreation. So um, you have to do everything you can to get ready for a tournament. And when you shoot a sporting clays, you're shooting three, uh, four pairs in a row. So in order to run stations and you have to get your score up, you have to be able to uh, repetitively and consistently execute the same move and process every time. So that's what I try to practice um, when I train. So just setting up um, drills, whether it be, you know, just things like trying to put pressure on yourself, like, put yourself in a tournament scenario like okay i'm gonna break four or five pairs here and then if i miss i'm gonna start over and i can't leave the station until then you know that kind of stuff i, I like to kind of keep it interesting because you don't want to you don't want to bore yourself out just going up there and just shooting every single time it's good to change things up but uh, right. the absolutely. main thing is to try to practice with purpose absolutely well joe i mean since we are starting a new year i mean do you ever what kind of goals are you setting are you are you kind of laying out a roadmap for what you want this year to be for you uh yes sir i think it's uh it's good to set goals and there's different types of goals. Um, there's goals as far as accomplishments, you know, um, like tournaments you, you really want to focus on or just things you want to do within the sport. So I think it's great to set goals and, and uh, work towards them. And that's how you can kind of measure your progression and success is by reaching them. And then when you do reach them, just kind of set another one a little higher, push you out of your comfort zone and keep working towards it. I mean, as far as, uh, focusing on, on things I would I would like to find success in, you know, I, I would just, I, I find every tournament, you know, of, of equal value. And I think you have to treat them like that, whether it be a, you know, a regional or the U.S. Open or the world. I try to not 
focus too much on the title of the tournament because I feel like that can kind of affect your outlook on it and your performance a little bit. So I just want to focus on kind of building upon last year and um, just doing everything I can to, to bring everything I have to each tournament, whether it be a state championship or even a little local tournament or whatever it is. I just want to focus on doing everything I can because sporting clays is, is a funny kind of a game. You know, sometimes – especially now with as good as the competition is everything kind of has to line up perfect for you in order to do well. So you kind of, you know, have to be able to, to prepare and go out and execute. And there's a little bit of luck involved too. So, um, whenever I get blessed enough with an opportunity to find success and hopefully win a tournament, as long as I do my job and, uh, preparing and practicing and, and getting to the tournament and making good decisions, hopefully that uh, things will go well. But, I mean, if I had to say a tournament, if you're looking for that, if we are lucky enough to go to Europe this summer, um, I would really love to, to do everything I can to compete at a high level for the United States team. If Team USA, you know, ends up, we end up having an opportunity to be on the team and, and go represent the country, I think that's the, the biggest honor. Uh, for nice. shooters to be able to represent your country on an international stage. So if I could, you know, go over there, whether it be in England or Hungary or both, and do well, uh, I really would look forward to that. You that's know? that's a very admirable goal, Joe. Yep, indeed. Seriously. Joe, I've got a question for you. Uh, so the past two years, you've had uh, some really fantastic performances. And I, I'm curious to know, in, in terms of yourself, what would you say that through those – let's just take something like your your runner-up finish at the World English in 2019 or your regional championship win this year. When you have a performance like that, okay, let, let's just take those two. Do you feel like in terms of who shows up those days – do you feel like there's consistency in the way that you're thinking, in the way that you're performing, in the way that you're making decisions, in the way that you have the ability to move the gun? Or would you say that um, you kind of have to play it by ear on making real-time decisions on what kind of approaches you're going to take to targets or how you're going to, uh, you know, handle, let's say, like the time in between rounds where you could either be social or not be social. Is it always the same Joe that's yes, there? Sir. And do you have a routine like that? Or are you are you someone more that relies on kind of gauging the situation at hand and then making more real-time decisions? And then also, yes, I would say, what what all did you learn from those those uh, performances? Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I think that's a awesome question, and it could be a little bit of both. I think a, a huge thing uh, as a shooter is uh, whether you're out on the practice course or you're at a tournament. Uh, each day you go out there and you shoot and you finish. You are building self awareness, and you're learning more about yourself. And you learn more about yourself as a as a shooter and as a competitor and just as a person. So you have to, you know, figure yourself out and then be able to apply that to the certain tournament you're at. So as far as a competition, I think as far as a mindset, you have to bring the same mentality mm -hmm. every single time and you have to bring the same uh, preparation and, and work ethic as you're preparing for a tournament uh, mentally and physically. Failing to prepare is preparing to, preparing to fail. Uh, that's a good saying I like to live by. Yeah. And um, the the thing about it, though, is it's not – you can't be exactly the same all the time because, you know, when you think about it, there's a big difference between shooting um, a tournament up in the northeast, like let's say up in New Jersey, and then going all the way out west to Nevada or Arizona and shooting a tournament there. Right. Um, you know, the – the climate's different. The presentations are different. A, a lot of things are different. So you just have to learn to adapt. Uh, but through that self-awareness and that mentality, you have to still bring the same mindset. And um, you have to just treat every opportunity the same. Because if you think about it, you know, you're still shooting a clay, whether you're in England or the United States or wherever, you know, you are, you're still shooting a clay target. The same clay target, you're going to have the same equipment. You have your same gun, same shells, same vest. So it's a little bit of both, but um, I would have to say that at each tournament you have to adapt and uh, 
be aware of, of yourself and your capabilities that week. Sometimes, you know, if you know yourself as a shooter, this this might be kind of hard to understand. But uh, some days you might want to be able to, to look at a target really long. And, you know, when you call for it, you're making shots, not ride a target, but be able to acquire it and be a little more patient with your shot and, uh, you know, not rush them. And some days you feel like you can shoot better, really aggressive and not overthinking it. So you just have to, you know, let the shot fly really quickly, you know. Yeah, if you try to bring your same your same persona um, and your same approach, but as a shooter, when you're in the round, you just have to do everything you can to break a target. And um, no matter what it is, you just have to make in shot and during round uh, adaptations. So, uh, how old are you? Seventeen, eighteen. <laughs> 17. Yeah. That, that would have been my answer when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. You no, know, well, it was. <laughs> That's a very good answer. And, that, and what was funny is in, in a lot of the things that you were saying, uh, I was trying to, to, in my head, answer the question. And in the same order that you mentioned some things in a list order, I, I in my head, had the same answer in the same order. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Joe is definitely way more mature than his age. Yes. For sure. No doubt. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Joe, let let me ask you something. Well, first of all, you know, here at the Dead Pair, we're all about introducing new shooters to the sport and then getting them to be competitors. You made a comment to me at the Florida State shoot, and you said something about the growth of this sport in your lifetime. Now, as someone that recently came out of youth shooting and found success at a high level pretty quickly, I'm interested in hearing your opinion as to what you have seen and what you think we can do to improve. And I ask everybody this question, so don't think you're being put on the spot. But we're very committed to that, and and I'm – I mean, as maturely as you just answered that last question, I'm very anxious to hear your answer to this one. Yes, sir. You know, I think there's no blueprint to uh, a question like that. There is no right or wrong answer. You just have to go out and do everything you can and uh, take advantage of opportunities. And uh, everything you don't take is a guarantee that you're not going to get anything out of it. You know what I mean? Like you're going to miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. Um, As far as as far as the growth goes, I mean, I'm only 17. I mean, yes, I shot. Uh, my first NSCA tournament when I was eight, but I was too young to really understand. I really didn't, until you travel, you can't really tell because there's a big difference. And a lot of people do this to where, you know, they shoot, they get comfortable in their shell, you know, in a local area. Yeah. And, you know, they may just shoot sporting clays within a 45 to an hour minute diameter radius of where they live mm-hmm. and then that's it but then you start traveling around you see different parts of the country different people and especially after i went and shot internationally for the first time last year i saw a, saw a lot of differences and I, I could compare a lot yes um what i think is great about the united states is i think it's a it's a fact that uh youth play target shooting is the, the fastest growing sport in the United States. I'm pretty sure. I mean, that's a fact, um, which is, which is really cool and unique. But the biggest thing I would say as far as trying to help the sport grow, cause it's on a, you know, it's on a good, it, it's, it's off to a great start. And even in my few years of shooting and traveling, which is, I would say is about four years of really, you know, going around and being able to see a lot. Um, I think it comes down to the people of older age and and experience who've been there and done that creating opportunities for the youth because, you know, the youth, at least for me and whatever it may be in life, I really uh, try to look up to and learn. And I respect a lot from people who have more experience than me because I think experience is really uh, vital because you can see change over time And, you know, people with experience, they they just been through more situations and they know a lot. Um, So as far as trying to help the sport grow, I think it's up to those, like even me, I've been very blessed. And we were talking about goals earlier. Like, yes, of course, as a competitor, I have goals to shoot well and win. But one of my biggest goals is, you know, helping the sport grow. And, um, you know... I am so blessed. I think that the biggest thing that has helped me is, you know, growing up here at Quill Creek and Okeechobee, Florida, I've been um, beyond just given many opportunities 
to be surrounded by a lot of great people. And I think those people that have surrounded me and older people who have taken me under their wing is what allowed me to really fall in love with the sport. And when you fall in love with something and you have a passion for it, you really enjoy it. And you enjoy seeing other people have fun with the same thing you do. So you want to introduce it to them because a lot of times it's not about just us. It's not about you, just you. It's about creating things for the sport itself and for other people because it's great to see other people happy. And I think a lot of people just don't know about sporting plays. Like if you just walk up to somebody random in the street somewhere in New York City or, you know, some big city somewhere in the world and say, hey, have you ever heard of baseball, football, or basketball? They're going to be like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I know what that is. Then if you're like, have you ever heard of sporting clays or clay target shooting? A lot of them don't know. And I think uh, it's up to to the, the generation now that's been upcoming to to go out and share this with a lot of people and just try to get as many people out, you know, and, and doing it, whether it be for recreation or, to, or for competitors. That's very well said, Joe. Um, so, hey, let, let's back up here for a second. Let's talk about something fun. Sean's coming down for the Gator Cup. He's got a ton of yes, questions sir. for you. Yeah, uh, boy, do um, I. I got a ton of answers. <laughs> well, and I don't want to be to put you on the spot. Um, I will say this. So I was able to come down and shoot Quail Creek last year for the first time. Uh, me and a friend came down and shot the Father's Day tournament. Uh, totally impressed awesome. by the facilities. Um, had an excellent meal. Um, I mean, the whole thing is just first class, and it's a, it's a really it's great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank yeah, you for it's coming. A, it's a wonderful place, and I urge anybody that can can get down there and shoot uh, at Quail Creek to definitely uh, take the time and go down there. Okay, so first up, you know, that's coming up real quick, a couple weeks away. Um, some concerns. Uh, do you think ammunition is going to be a problem to find? I've had some friends going down there in the last month to go down there to, to shoot and practice and travel around. They're having some hard times locating ammo. What do you think is going to be the, uh, the, the end result of all those shooters coming down there? Are they going to have enough ammo available to shoot the tournament? Yeah, I think, problems? uh, I think there will be availability to get ammunition. Will there be, the opportunity to have as much variety um, and quantity as years before, I'm not sure. If I had to give you an answer, probably not. But uh, don't you know? Don't quote me on that because I'm not 110. percent At least here in Quail Creek, the ammunition we sell, we do uh, have a lot of ammunition here right now. We have a lot in stock. Um, we're getting more. We're getting as much as we can. Uh, so I know Quail Creek will have a, a pretty good amount. Will prices be a little more? There's a good chance because, I mean, I, we're seeing that all across the country. Oh, yeah. Um, I know there are shell vendors that are, you know, planning on, on coming to the Gator Cup. So as far as if you're not going to bring your own ammunition and you can come here, I don't think there's going to be any, you know, shortage or anything like that where you come up and, you know, it's so scarce that you're not going to have shells for the tournament. Yeah, well, I mean, that's. Uh, I think everybody will have a fair chance to get them. Yeah, that's been one of my concerns because, I mean, I do have ammunition here and I'm flying down, so I would have to ship it. And obviously, you know, UPS or whoever I use to ship it down there, it's going to be an added added cost. So I would love to be able to buy shells there. Uh, As far as the shells that are available at Quail Creek, are you able to just buy them there? Can you advance purchase shells before you get down there, or do you know? You can. You can advance purchase and reserve. That's what I would highly recommend. A lot of people did that last year, even before the the, the shortage or the, the price boost, whatever you want to call it, kind of started um you can call ahead and reserve ammunition um i think it it is limited like you can't call and you know just say hey i want 50 cases you know what i mean like you just can't get a full pallet or something but i mean at least for enough for competition you can and you know if somebody's really comfortable with a certain shell it's like hey i'm not gonna shoot anything but this i I would say i I recommend if you can have somebody bring your shells for you that's you know what i would i would recommend because it's better safe than sorry but i mean there's a chance there's a variety you go into stores like you know walmart bass pro shops there's still plenty of shotgun ammunition there uh pistol and certain rifle loads is a different story but as far as you know shotgun clay target competition loads they're around a well, less see, I, but there's still plenty. I, I told him this, and he's telling me right now I'm number one. But it, uh, he, I told him this uh, two weeks ago. I'm like, call down there and buy your ammo ahead of time. 
Thanks, Joe. I appreciate you backing me up on this. Well, you don't realize it, but you just did. Well, the, the no tr- problem. Now I might not be. I might not be 110. Like I said, <laughs> I might be a little, little off on some of this stuff. But I mean, it's pretty safe answers. Like, what, I'm, what I can guarantee you is, I don't think you're going to come to the tournament. And if you don't have any shells, and then not have ammunition like you, you're here and you just completely don't have any ammo i don't think i don't think that's going to be a problem okay well the other part of that story that jason's not letting you know <laughs> is that we had a friend that was going to go down there with his uh camper and tow it down there well most of us are flying down and he offered to haul all of our shells well he had a, a last minute cancellation come up and he wasn't able to go so now oh, we're, no. so now we're all scrambling trying to figure out what are we going to do for ammo so hence the question and i appreciate and the I told answer. you to call and, down to quail creek okay thank you mom <laughs> appreciate it mother it is a it's a first come first serve thing though so i mean i would try to get on it yeah call ahead can. Yep, I'll definitely be making a phone call tomorrow. You got it. All right, so another question for you. Um, Now, that said, I know this is a big event, and there's a lot of people that register for this event, you know, well in advance. Um, We kind of took a wait-and-see approach this year, obviously with the virus and not even knowing if we were going to be able to go. Uh, And by the time we were able to register, I think the only thing I was able to register for was the main and the prelim. Now, one of my questions would be, <clears throat> and you may not know this, so again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but with all the the corona stuff going on, do you see a lot of cancellations happening to where some things will open up? Because there was just literally nothing else we could sign up for other than the prelim and the main event. Um, and I'm not sure how long they go or before they'll, if, if they're not going to know until the day of the tournaments when people aren't going to be there or, or how far in advance we would have notice to be able to sign up for other events that, uh, that right now show that they're fully booked and you can't register for. Yes, sir. Um, well, at least for sure, as far as the event going on, the event definitely go as of now, we are uh, blessed to have a governor in this state who's supportive of businesses being open and people being able to get out and about and go on with their lives uh, with this virus. Um, so the events definitely go, um, there are, um, a couple of situations that have been thrown our way, uh, dealing international competitors, being able to attend. We would love to have them. We would love to welcome them in uh, the Gator cup. Um, you know, if you've been in the years you see over the pavilion, we have all the flags of international countries and, and competitors that come. There's multiple people from around the world mm-hmm. that come to this event, but because of the unfortunate situation at hand, um, some of the in, um, international competitors have backed out, not like crazy numbers, um, but enough to open up spots in certain events. So it's definitely good to get on a waiting list because you never know. I mean, anything could happen. Um, but there are a lot of people, at least from the United States that were already on waiting lists for a while. So I know those spots filled up, but it's always good to call, um, call, call the people that are, you know, working with registration, you know, call the clubhouse at Quail Creek, just do anything you can to just get on a waiting list or say, Hey, these are the events I want to shoot or, you know, it's good to get your, your, your name down as early as you can, because it's, it's also a first come first year kind of thing. Uh, but I do know that international shooters because of the virus um well not many of them will be able to come this year so those gotcha. openings will will be um there for availabilities okay and, and one more question for me and then i'll turn it back over to jason because he's busting to ask you something else <laughs> um do you know who's setting targets this year i do I'm not exactly sure on um all the events themselves but uh doug vine uh, always sets a lot of the targets he normally sets the main event blue course and pt task he's a he, he comes here he basically sets all the targets at quail creek year round so a lot of people are have shot doug's targets and they know that you know when he gets the green light to crank them up you know he is very fun and flavorful with his presentations so uh, be ready for a lot of Doug Vine presentations. He's been out here uh, weeks in advance, writing stuff down, creating things. So I know he's working hard and excited. I'm pretty sure Joe Skull's coming back. Uh, from oh, in, nice. Uh, Jersey, yeah, he's coming. He's going to set the red course like he did last year. Um, unfortunately, very sadly, with the passing of Chuck Frazier, you know, obviously he won't be able to be here, um, you know, very sad situation. He's been setting targets here for many years. He normally sets a five stand, a couple other events, but 
Um, you know, we're a very sad situation to lose him. So we're going to have a couple other people come set targets. But um, my dad, most of the time, sets all the sub gauges events and super sporting. And um, as of right now, those are the three that I can give you for sure. Uh, we definitely do call in people. Um, I'm not 100%. Some people are, are not sure if they'll be able to come also because of the virus, you know what I mean, things like that. But those are three that you can definitely count on. And Doug does set quite a bit of the events. Uh, like I said, main fee task. I'm begging my dad, absolutely begging him every day to let me set one of the events, whether it be a three <laughs> oh, or five stand. I ask him, I, I kid you not, every day when I wake up and when I go to bed, I ask him. Uh, it's pretty much a no every single time. <laughs> they, they have they have let me set them before, but I I get a little carried away and just set monsters basically on every station. So I love it. It's not too much of a of a balanced course. He's scared I'm going to run people away and kind of shy him off. So I, I don't think he's going to let me set them, unfortunately. But maybe one day. Yeah. Well, speaking those from ex- the three, those are the three you can count on. Well, speaking from experience, I know we shot a tournament one time that David set at Cardinal, and boy, oh boy, that's a <laughs> yeah. that was an eye opening experience. Yeah, hey, I, I love him. I love it that way. I, I yeah. Just silly to the run always be set at least for me I, I wish they could but you know you have to keep in mind everybody you know that comes to the tournament everybody's uh, there to, to shoot well and, and the older I get the more I realize that but I was always like man they should be you know 60 yard uh, middies coming off of a tower full spring every single station you know what I, mean? of course. I, I love well, shooting targets when, like that when David set targets at Cardinal he left every station thinking man Digweed would love this man Folds <laughs> would love this it's, yeah, he doesn't understand that his ears were burning for two weeks after that so <laughs> uh, but, hey, I, I love presentations like that that sounds yeah. like a lot of fun Joe you want to do some rapid fire questions uh oh uh, sure, I'd be glad to just answer them real quick. So it's real simple. All right, first question: Gun, Breda A four hundred, chokes, pure gold diamond series. I normally use a twenty or a fifteen. Excellent. Um, shells, uh, Basquiat and Pelagri. I use the F two mod, uh, thirty two gram, uh, thirteen hundred feet per second, seven and a half and eights. Nice glasses. Kila Outlaw 7X. Vest or shell bag? Uh, Castellani vest. Ear protection. Uh, I, I have a couple different Castellanis, but yeah. uh, recently I've been using the Rio. Oh, nice. That's what I have. Um, ear protection. Uh, ESP. Awesome. Well, Joe, do you have anything else you want to add or any closing thoughts or anything? No, I just really uh, want to say thank you to you guys uh, for what you're doing. And um, we were talking earlier, you know, just about things you'd like to do and just, you know, for the sport and, you know, you guys with this podcast and everybody else, you know, who's doing things that we need to be advocates for the sport and proud of the sport we're a part of. And if we want to give back to it, we got to help make it grow. So I just want to say thank you, you guys, because you're doing a lot um, to help help the sport grow by doing this and uh, whether it be through you know social media or just introducing people hand in hand uh, to the gun and getting people out who don't have an opportunity just kind of touching up on the question from earlier you were saying you know with the youth shooting growing just the sport growing itself things like this things like you guys you know doing this podcast and you know people sharing their experience and introducing other people uh, everybody has to do their part and if we all you know go take someone out to the gun range somebody who, who doesn't have a chance somebody who normally wouldn't um put a smile on their face help them enjoy it and then tell them to tell someone else and tell them to tell someone else and, and next thing you know you got a bunch of people who never even knew how to hold a gun out there on the sporting clays range and now they're going to tournaments so that's that's what it's all about is helping the sport grow and you know trying to give back so that's that's all i'd have to say for for people listening and uh thank you to you guys for what you're doing to, to help uh do that already that, that's an excellent point and yeah. thank you for for complimenting you, us you said you were 37 right not 17 <laughs> <laughs> no no 17 joe you wow. are, you are a very respectful young man and you're you're going to be a great ambassador of this sport and we greatly appreciate having you on the dead pair seriously 
Oh, I appreciate you guys a lot and uh, really uh, excited and looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Um, everybody's working hard here at Quail Creek to get ready for the Gator Cup and uh, host everybody to have a good time. I you know, see the whole staff working so hard uh, each and every day and, you know, living here with my parents, I get to see a lot of the cool behind the scenes stuff. So just uh, we're getting ready to, to welcome everybody in. Look forward to seeing you guys. And uh, let me know if there's, if there's anything I can do to help. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank Appreciate you, Joe. it very much. And uh, sorry it was so late, but you can blame David for that one. I'm so. always late. No problem. <laughs> no problem. It's not that big of a deal at all. You'll have a good one. Thanks, you too, buddy. Joe. You good too. All right. Take care, Joe. Take care. Yes, sir. All right. Bye. Wow. That was, uh, that was a heck of an interview with Joe. Uh, it's, it's really hard to believe that at 17-year-old, uh, 17 years old, uh, he talks like he's 37, wow. maybe even 47. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just blows me away. It's, it's like, who are you and how do you know this stuff? <laughs> well, I think that's a testament to his parents. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And hats off to, to him and to all of his, all his success. Um, yeah, just amazing information, amazing kid. And I, we wish you nothing but the best. Yeah. You can tell listening to him, there's a direct correlation between his maturity level and his uh, proficiency level in the game. Yeah. And, and there's a reason why those things are correlated. You know? Yeah. I mean, as serious as he takes his life and, and as mature as he is and how respectful he is, he, he takes that same approach to the seriousness that he, you know, approaches the game and, and it shows. Yeah. yeah. You don't get to that level without having your act together. Yeah. <laughs> well, Speaking of that level, David, I'm going to put you in the hot seat again. <laughs> <laughs> this seat's already hot. I, well, you know. Um, boy, how do I approach this? Okay, you were almost expected to be a world champion. Now, let me elaborate. You went to Wendell at a very young age. Um, you were fortunate enough that your parents were able to afford you the opportunity to train as much as you did, um, you understood sports, sports ethics. Um, you respected the game and it was almost like a perfect roadmap to a world championship. Yeah. But that being said, what did it mean to you to win the world championship? And, and before you answer that, for guys like Sean and I at our age, Mm -hmm. I'm 48. He's, 47 and for us to win a world championship that would be like an unattainable goal okay the where we're at in our lives where we're at in our shooting it's just not reachable okay and and don't get me wrong i'm I'm not saying we will never stop trying when we shoot but the commitment the time the money the resources it's just not there so for us it's like wow that's this big giant rainbow in the sky what was it for you to win the world championship uh it's kind of a i mean what you said is 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 pretty true Uh, you know i mean i'm i'm only 27 years old uh right now but i've been shooting for two decades right competitively you know so uh and joe you know said it on the interview he said you know he started when he was eight years old um, and when you start so young and you have the, you know, I see it all the time in my students, I have kids that'll come to me that have, there's, you know, they'll have the desire, they have the talent, they have the, um, the, they live in an area where they can, can shoot as much as they need to, but they don't have the, the financial backing or they, or they have all of that and they don't have the desire or they don't have the talent. There's always one thing missing, you know? Right. Um, and, and I was very, very fortunate and blessed that I didn't have anything missing. You know, I, I had, my parents had the money, I had the time, I had the desire, I, I loved the game enough, I had the talent, I had the right coach, I, all the things. Um, and I get, I get asked that question a lot, uh, what does it feel like to win a world championship? And I always, my whole life, you know, if I start at eight years old, you, you know, for... 15 years I wanted wanted to know that too um and you build it up into this huge thing in your head you know uh if you've if you've never attained something like that 
And I worked it up into this thing that was going to be this, you know, culmination, pinnacle of the sport, pinnacle achievement. You know, there's nothing else you can get in my sport bigger than that. I can't make it to the Olympics because it's not in the Olympics. If I win a world feed test, it's like the thing. Right. Right. And you win a world championship and you're like, well, uh, nothing really changed. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and then it was a very. defining moment for me because you know and and in the interview that we just had with with joe finese um the reason why i asked him the question that i asked him was because i to me self-awareness is a huge thing and i was really impressed and actually really happy that he answered the question that i asked with this theme of self-awareness um and because when i won that shoot it was a huge moment of self-awareness for me that was that I finally th- realized why I do this. And it's not because I want to win a world championship. It's because I love the game. And w- because when I won it, I, literally nothing changed. I got on the plane the next day on Monday morning and I didn't feel any different. I wasn't happier. I mean, I was happier, but I wasn't like, it, it didn't, it was weird to say that it didn't affect me, but um three or four days later, I forgot about it. I mean, I, not really, you know, but it yeah. wasn't like, um, it wasn't like, uh, Oh, now I can finally do this. Or th- it, literally nothing really changes when you win something like that. You realize it's a, it's a trophy that sits in the, in the, um, in the trophy shelf at my parents' house that I don't even see anymore, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you move past it and you move on. And I think that, uh, someone that can win a world championship, um, is probably going to have a mindset, something like that, because at the end of the day, it's not about what you're winning. It's about, you know, you have to love the game to win a a, a thing like that's why for me, uh, you know, my girlfriend is, is an Olympic athlete. She's, she's going to the Olympics in 2020 or 2021 in Tokyo. And it would be really cool if I could do that same type of thing. You know, it's a very similar sport. It's, it's clay target shooting. But I know that I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to make an Olympic team because I don't love that game as much as I love my game. And I know that that's what makes me good. So something that Lanny Basham said is after he won a gold medal, he kind of hit this dark place, if you will. Yeah. And his wife brought it up to him and said, well, you reached your goal, but you haven't set another goal. Mm -hmm. So he hit his pinnacle. He reached his goal, but he didn't have another goal past that. So did you find yourself in that spot to where I need to set another goal? Uh, I stumped him, Sean. Yeah, Look at this. I got him. Wheels are turning. <laughs> Wheels are turning. Um, yes and no. I think when I realized that, that, that you know, Winning a world championship, uh, dang it, you did get me. (laughs) I mean, Joe talked about it. You know, there's different types of goals, Um, and and I've I've never been a big. I I separate them into what I call process oriented goals and product oriented goals. Product it's pretty simple to understand the difference. Product is a is an achievement, and process is something you're putting in motion and doing. Right. Um, and uh, for me, I've never been a big product-oriented goal person because I feel like if I have good process-oriented goals, the products come with them. And uh, so I and, and it didn't really, I didn't feel like I was lost at all because, I mean, I'm, I'm after the thing of trying to understand me. Go back to how Joe answered that question. It's about, you know... I, I'm, I'm literally always learning every shoot I go to, there's something new that I experience and there's something better that I can learn how to do. And so if I, if I always make it to where every shoot I go to win, lose, draw, whatever, good performance, bad performance. Um, if I can go back and say, what's one thing that I could do better there. If it was, if it was whatever it is, um, I'm going to make it so I never make that mistake again. And so I, I think my viewpoint is so compressed at a very finite level, at a ground level, uh, that winning or losing, you know, doesn't really get me lost in that way. But also, I'm not somebody that I'm, I don't get amped up by winning and I don't get bummed out by losing. I, you know, that's just the way that I am. 
Yeah. You, you brought up Kaylee in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Do you ever see or do you think there's ever a possibility that sporting clays will be in the Olympics? Uh, no. Why? Because uh, I'm pro- if, if there's going to be a lot of people listening to this, I'm probably going to be completely wrong about it. But uh, <laughs> the So the Olympics have this thing that's called right to compete, which means that every person – trying to make the team needs to have an equal and uh, an equal opportunity to make the team and to, to try to make the team. Um, also other, every country kind of has, has an, have an equal opportunity uh, to compete in the Olympics. So sporting clays or sporting, which is fee task is not something that every country has the opportunity of being able to do, okay. uh, which is also why something like <clears throat> golf took so long to get into the Olympics because not every country has the ability to have an 18 hole golf course for everybody to compete on. That's right. why for clay target shooting in the Olympics, if you look at all the games, they're very, they're very simplified. Not, not that they're easier games, but it, right, in right. terms of space, they yeah. take up much less space than sporting uh, does. So, um, if, if we're going to have a sporting version of, of clay target shooting in the Olympics, it would be something like compact. That's uh, yeah. I was going to go there. I thought I heard that they were going to try and push for that. That's been, it's been that way for a long time, but I just don't, you know, there we're at the point where we're taking games out of the Olympics. Now I don't think we're going to add another one for shooting. You know I mean? They took out double strap. I don't know why they'd add another one. I would love that. That'd be awesome. Um, but again, it's just a game that, you know, you know, it's it, not everybody has the opportunity to do that. Well, and there you go with opportunity is there's so many other countries that guns just aren't allowed. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, unfortunately, things we take for granted. Right. Yeah. And well, yeah, we need to keep making sure that we have that opportunity. Yeah. yeah well, absolutely. you know, we say that, but <clears throat> the thing, uh, what's really interesting about that is in, in other countries where, where it is harder to own a gun or to, or to participate in shooting sports, the shooting sports athletes are actually, I mean, you know, for example, you go to Italy and you buy a can of Pepsi and a vending machine and there's probably going to, there might be a shooter on the can of Pepsi. No, that's not an exaggeration. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, shooting is the third largest sport in the Olympics. Wow. Yeah. That's, it goes track and field, swimming, shooting. Yeah, that's that's a very unpublicized yes. fact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely interesting. Little bit of tidbit of knowledge there. Yeah. Um, golly, we're kind of winding down to things. I'm trying to think what else can I ask David. I mean, there's a million one questions. We've got him sitting right here in our podcast room, and I'm just trying to. <laughs> Dude, think. it's not like he's a freaking world champion or I, something. I mean, not, I, we, we've covered that. <laughs> I think we've covered that. I think most people that are listening probably know that. Um, I'm trying to go back to what we can offer our, our listeners, the, the beginning guys. Um, what, what do you think? I mean, we, we keep pushing this, this angle of we're trying to get more shooters in the sport. Mm-hmm. Uh, beginning shooters transition them from the weekend hobbyist to a registered shooter. Yeah. Um, we see a lot of success with families bringing in their kids, you know, a husband bringing in a wife because we see a lot of that on the, on the field and in the, in the tournaments, um, outside of people who are already shooters, what can we do to promote an advertiser? What avenues should we be looking at to promote and advertise this sport to the rest of the country? Uh, I think in order to do that, we first need to look within the people that already kind of participate in the sport. Um, our, our governing organization has 25,000 people in it, but the country has 16 million that participate in it and, uh, or that have participated in it, it participated in it. Um, so I would say, you know, the first thing that we could do is, you know, uh, I think as an organization, we need, we need to think more grassroots. Uh, and that's why I really like things like podcasts, like what you're doing or, uh, you know, anything like this that kind of reaches the guy at the beginning of this, of of the game. Um, you know, why does our governing organization focus on big regional tournaments where we have the same 500 people traveling in, in, uh, uh, 
uh, of in, in kind of our own little vacuum of competition from one place to the next place. When we have these clubs like Eagles Nest and Hillendale and South Cuyahoga Sportsman's Association and C4 and stuff like that, that, that that's where, I mean, let me ask you something. If you, where, what size club do you think has more shooters holistically? Something like Northbrook and and Cardinal Center, or something you know, like if you pick all of the biggest clubs in the country, pile them together, and figure out how many shooters ever go to those, and then you pick all of the smaller clubs in the country, pile them up, and say how, how many shooters go to those. What what category do you think reaches more people? Why are we focusing on the smallest one? Right. You know, I mean, I think that if we're if we're trying to bring more people into the game, what we need to do is bring more people into an organization that's that's, uh, uh, you know, organized in a way to which we can disseminate information to get people to participate more, to sign up, to go to their club, to buy a membership to, you know, whatever, participate in purchasing and, and having, you know, uh, uh, money flowing through within the industry. And. Um, I think we need to work on, on smaller clubs. I think we should reach out, teach them how to run, you know, their, their facilities better, get connected with the people that are coming in for corporate events every day. You know I mean? I teach at a place in Houston that has 250 corporate events a year. Wow. Uh, None of those people have ever even heard of the NSCA. Wow. You know, well, and, and to credit to what you're saying, um, <clears throat> and I'm not going to mention the club. There's a local club here that their last, well, prior to Memorial Day weekend, their last tournament had 280 shooters. Amazing. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Memorial Day weekend, they had 350 people off the street. Mm-hmm. He's like, why am I throwing tournaments? Yeah. You know, he, he, and he said, he, he says, look, at a tournament, I have to pay trappers. I have to, you know, it's a lot more work. Yeah. And you, you know that. Yeah. Okay. So Memorial Day weekend, he has 350 shooters that he doesn't have to pay attention to the course other than loading traps. Yeah. He doesn't have to have shooters. He doesn't have to have lunch. He doesn't have, you know what I mean? It's not this big organizational thing. It's not a big event. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, why am I throwing tournaments? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you think about that for a minute. It's like, okay, here's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you got 350 people off the street that want to come break clay targets. Can't we get like three quarters of them to want to compete. Yeah. I mean, you know, but there, there's this, or just sign up for a membership, you know, yeah. right. Why yeah. don't we offer a free membership package? Why isn't there a level of membership in NSCA that doesn't cost anything for the, for the person signing up, but also doesn't cost anything for the organization. Well, there, that, there is, a, there is a complimentary NSCA membership. Yeah. But what I'm saying is if we got 16 million people that participate in this game, we have access to every shoot, every club in the country, right? Why don't we reach out and say, hey, every person that comes into your club for a corporate event or for fun, offer them this free membership level. They don't get anything from us, but they're also a membership. And then we can go to someone, like you said, Budweiser or whoever, and say, hey, we don't have 25,000 members. We have 16 million members. Why don't you sponsor our organization that's a good point. right yeah that's very good yeah see we should have had him on when we had mike hampton on. yeah there yeah. you go <laughs> could have got it all figured we out in one, yeah. one setting we can we could solve the the world clay problems right here and <laughs> so well it kind of goes back on the club right i mean you know it's it's uh and i know not all clubs are quite created equal um but you know obviously the clubs probably need to do a little bit more about raising awareness uh, for the NSCA registered shooters and that kind of thing that, and then, you know, I guess that's the reason we still do it today. We were offered, uh, the year we joined, there was a complimentary membership, uh, that we were offered. And ever since then we've been hooked. We keep renewing year after year. We keep chasing the tournaments and having fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, maybe there's just a way that the clubs can kind of push it a little bit more, try to get people that are coming out there at least, you know, once or twice a month that are, enjoying what they're doing already to kind of accept the fact that, Hey, you know, just take it up one more notch and yeah. compete a little bit. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll make this thing grow after all. 
Every yeah. everybody, you know, talks about that we need to get big corporate sponsorship into the into the game. We need to grow the uh, you know the the reach of the organization and stuff like that. And you know, we need to have things on TV and the internet. But the, but the problem is, how are we going to do that if if we limit ourselves to such a small you know twenty five thousand people is nothing. Right. That's not that's yeah. 25,000 people but really it's about 5,000 participating members. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. And so I mean really if you think about it if you want big if you want money in the game that's going to that will will grow marketing will grow reach to new you know, growing the sport, you know, if you bring more money in the game, you can advertise, you can put it on TV, you can reach people that have otherwise never heard of the sport that want to try it, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want that influx and change to the sport, then then you have to have a reason for it to be there. And there's not right. a single person that has a marketing degree that's working for a Fortune 500 company that's going to say, oh, gosh, we got let's put this 15 million dollars into this organization that has enough, uh, you know, yeah. as, as little people that work in our factory. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's well said. Yeah, it's, sure. a, it's definitely a numbers game. Yeah, but it's so easy to get the numbers. You yeah, know? yeah, just got to do the right things. And yeah. I, I mean, and, and we see it constantly, time and time again. Both Jason and I, we try to take new people out all the time, friends, family, business associates, uh, you name it, and uh, they they almost always have a great time going out there breaking oh, numbers. Yeah. Uh, and they don't have to hit that many. Just it's just that expression when they finally break that first bird. It's priceless. And, oh, then, and yeah. then you just know they're like, oh, yeah, they like this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do it for I do it for a living. And I've never seen somebody not have fun shooting this game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even people that you think no way are they going to enjoy this. You convince them to try it one time and they're they're like, OK, but just one more. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Just you know? one more. I'll yeah. try one more. So like, well, you're going to be sore tomorrow. OK, but just one more. Yeah. You know? Well, I was telling you about the in-laws that I took shooting. Yeah. Uh, the, the one girl that shot with us, she shot eight. Out of a hundred, uh, yeah. The last pair on the last station, she turned around with this huge smile on her face, and the first words out of her mouth were, "When can we do this again?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. I mean, it was freezing cold. She'd never shot a gun before. Yep. The gun didn't fit her, so it was kicking her like a mule. Mm-hmm. She shot eight out of a hundred, and she turned around with this huge smile on her face. And I'm like, that right there. I mean. Throw the podcast out the window. Throw everything I've ever done out the window. That made me so happy. Yeah. Because I made her that happy. Yes. You know? And I, I just wish more people would influence that. Oh, yeah. yeah so Definitely. <laughs> but So, okay. When's the club going to be up and running? When's the, when's the club going to be done? Uh, I'm, I, well, last time I was on here, I said March 1. We're going to be a little bit later. Uh, so I'm imagine thinking, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking it's going to be mid March, mid March. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I'm booking my flight for April 1st. There you go. You're going to have Joel Dondas there to <laughs> cook me, to cook me dinner. I can't afford <laughs> Joel Dondas. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you understand? Do, well, see, Sean, I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bash him, but he doesn't know who Joel is. Oh yeah. So he was Emerald's sous chef. Sous chef. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's one of his students. Okay. And to say that this man can cook a meal is probably an understatement. That's yeah, Joel, Joel was uh, Emerald's sous chef, and, and he was there during the beginning of Emerald's restaurants and and uh, and everything. But that's, that, in all honesty, I, in my opinion, that's uh, not giving him enough credit because after that, which was a long time ago, he, he started – a bunch of his own companies and restaurants, and um, he, he's a, a serial restaurateur in New Orleans, uh, which if you know anything about the food industry, if you have multiple like he, highly rated restaurants, top restaurants in New Orleans, then you're doing that, well. You're yes. doing something right. Yeah. 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 And yeah. he can cook. I, I'm not kidding you. This is a really fast story. I went to the Louisiana State shoot and stayed at his house, and he had about 20 people over. And uh, one night for dinner, and he cooked a five course meal f- that was as good. As, uh, we we had um, a crawfish etouffee. We had oh, uh, wow. we had uh, like 
this fancy pineapple ice cream dessert we had. Uh, I don't even know. I can't, it's, I can't even pronounce a lot of the different courses. <laughs> yeah. But five-course meal for 20 people that he cooked in front of us while he was entertaining us. And he did all of it faster than I could have microwaved 20 Hot Pockets. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Dead serious. And it was like, the, it was amazing. I'm like, holy cow. This is another level of cooking. You know, you know, I lived in Texas for like five years. And so there's a barbecue joint and a Tex-Mex on every Street corner, yeah. right? So I, I've had some of the best barbecue in the world. But it wasn't until I, I used to travel back and forth to Louisiana, go to the casinos all the time. Yeah. And it wasn't until I went to Louisiana, I was like, okay, now I know what good food is. I love yeah, crawfish Cajun etouffee, uh, boudin. I mean, I can go mm. on and on and on. Those people know how to cook. And what you're telling me about Joel. So when I come down April 1st, yes. you're going to have Joel there, right? Because <laughs> I don't want no mac and cheese from you and Kaylee. <laughs> I want Joel there. <laughs> but, so actually, if you come, Joel, I'm, I have, we, we have a menu there for when people come. Because uh, we have like we're, we have like a, um, a like in a way a commercial kitchen. Um, that's built into the lodge, and and Joel has two of the menu items on the. Oh, heat. nice! Yeah. So, sweet. Yeah, very nice. Well, I, I definitely want to come down. Um, yeah. When you get it done, I want to come down and visit. Um, I don't know if I can afford your lessons or not, <laughs> but you know, it, I, I, I definitely want to come down and shoot some targets and have yeah, some absolutely. fun. So it's uh, I, it's really cool um, to do something like this in the industry. I've never been part of you know the formation of a club or anything like that and i have to say i gotta sh i gotta thank some people you know that in this industry so permatic if it wasn't from permatic i would not be able to start this club um kaylee and i would not be able to to do this it'd be unaffordable um if it what i have some students um uh a, a guy named doug blowers is literally probably going to save me about a hundred thousand dollars in dirt work um wow. and you know coming down to do everything for me uh rent the machines himself uh you know i mean people just come out of the woodwork we have i have another guy um who's donating all the furniture um for it who's got some furniture stores um and you know it's that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, what other kind of, I mean, maybe you can in other industries, but I just think it's so cool that, you know, in an industry that is, that seems big, but really is so small that yeah. you have the industry people coming in to help out that because they're like, Oh, we got another club that's helped this because it can help us, right. you know, right. and, um, and help grow the sport. And I just think that, you know, that's a cool thing. Yeah. Well, I think it's testament to, how much fun the sport is. Everybody wants to chip in. They want to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, um, you, you got people that are helping you. They're, you know, if I had to guess, they're probably students. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're, they're excited. They want to be a part of it. And let's face it. If there was a club here locally, I'd probably donate my time to, to, right. to go help. And you know, that somebody that needed help getting started. So, I mean, it, it's awesome. You know, I mean, I know that, you know, Jake and Luke are planning big things for Cardinal. Um, I know they're going to move their sporting facility here in the future, and mm -hmm. Which that's I, kind of exciting. Yeah. You know? um, Dan's always got something new for us. Yeah. Um, Hillendale's got something new. You know, C4 is expanding. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And it, it's exciting when a club does something new, and now you've got a completely brand new. It's not even going to be a club. It's a training facility. Yeah. And that's exciting to people. I mean, people want to get involved. They want to help. I think it's just more testament to the sport, really. Yeah, it is. It, I love anytime there's any club that when they make money, they put it back into the club for the people that are going there to experience. I'm 100% in support of that. Yeah. And that's all yeah. those clubs that you just mentioned there, they do that. For sure. You know? Yeah, absolutely. They get a big shoot. They they make nicer stations. They buy robots for their members to train on, on like at C4. They build bigger clubhouses or pavilions like Dan for, at, at, you know, I mean, every place. It's That's cool. Yeah. you got to yeah. support that, you know. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Sean, 
this has been one heck of an episode. It has been. We've we've ran long, and and I'm sure people are going to be wondering what the heck we were up to. But we've, boy, oh boy. I mean, we had it's a lot to process. David's here. We had Joe. We yep. had Ryan. Yep. I mean, you're getting ready to head to Gator Cup. Gator Cup, which I'm <laughs> uh, I, I hesitated because I'm still jealous. Well, you already went to the Florida State shoot, yeah, so but it's, I want to stay there. It's my turn. <laughs> I don't want to come home. My turn. Sorry. Let's warm it down there. Yes. I, I'll trade white snow for white sand any day. Uh, I've already had enough, so I'm going to go <laughs> see what that's all about. Yeah, all right. So, well, Sean, good luck to you. Thank down you. There. Yeah, good Appreciate luck. Appreciate it. Um, David, I wish you the best. You and thank Kaylee you. with your club. Um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks awesome for having, having me. Yeah, it's been great having you yeah, here. Yeah, thanks for yeah. staying up later because I got here late. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you had to stop and recharge your batteries. I get it. So. Um, <laughs> So that's, you know, this, this Tesla cars, you got to stop and buy energizer batteries on the way here. Yeah. So you want to <laughs> feed, this, feed this the is, bunny. This is a, this is a one minute story and it's worth telling the, when I got the car, I had to drive up, I had to pick the car up in Ohio and I, on the way up, I just got a bunch of new Promatic. So I had to buy batteries for them. And I have a student up here that you guys probably know George Millsop or, or maybe you have or haven't. I I've heard know. of him. Yeah. Okay. So George, uh, he, I bought a bunch of, uh, interstate batteries from him and so i was driving up i drove up here in my truck i, I picked up uh, a bunch of interstate batteries from george and the next day i had to go pick up my tesla so mm -hmm. i uh i drove into the tesla dealership and um i like parking the thing and my car is waiting out there and the in the sales or the salesman guy comes out and he goes if you got to unload anything in the car do that now or we're getting the paperwork ready i said okay can i have somebody help me with the batteries and the guy he stopped and he looked at me he goes <laughs> What do you mean? I said, well, I, I brought all the batteries I need for the car. And he goes, what, you don't, what batteries you talking about? I said, well, I got, I have, I got, I got 10, I think I had, tw I said, I got 20, uh, 12 volt batteries in my truck for the car. Don't I need the batteries? I thought it's an electric car. And the guy was so confused and he thought I was lying. I said, no, I'm serious. And so I opened the back of my truck up and he's sitting there looking at these brand, I mean, brand new 12 volt interstate batteries. He goes, no, these are that. lithium ion. I was like, so you're telling me I bought the wrong ones? Oh, geez. Oh man. It was so funny. Oh, that's hilarious. I would love to see the expression on his face because oh, I'd be like, what? <laughs> this idiot, you know? Oh, <laughs> Not very God. often you get this guy in camo coming up to buy a Tesla with a bunch of batteries in his truck. <laughs> Somebody told him something. Oh, yeah. man. Did you ever see the Pepsi commercial with Jeff Gordon where he... I love that commercial. He doctored yes. himself up. <laughs> it's the best commercial. <laughs> the test drive. I hopped the salesman in the Camaro yeah. and that was oh, off. Man. <clears throat> yeah, that's what, I, that's what I think of when David pulls up with 20 interstate <laughs> batteries to buy a Tesla. Oh, my god. And gosh. the cool thing is they all fit in the car, too. <laughs> Oh, oh man, oh. what's the world coming to? A world champion is driving a Tesla and hauling twenty interstate batteries around. Oh, oh man, man. got to do what you got to do. Yeah, well, David, thank you very much, man. Yeah, it's, thank you, it's guys. It's been awesome. Appreciate um, it. You're welcome here anytime, as yeah. you know. Um, Sean, yeah, keep us posted on the progress of the new uh, shooting facility we'll and. Do. You know, we'd love to be able to kind of come check it out one of these days. Yeah, we're For building sure. a podcast studio down there. So when you guys come down, we'll do a, we'll have we'll have to film a joint one. Oh, that'd, cool. That'd be really cool. That'd be cool. We'll go down yeah. and shoot and drink his bourbon and yeah. you know. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Eat good food and sure. We'll we'll, uh, we'll, have, we'll do a podcast with him and Kayla. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks guys. We appreciate it. We've got more coming for you on the dead pair, so stay tuned.